Hi there. Thanks for your enrollment. We are in one minute ad break. In this break, I'm going to show you that I have so many courses uploaded over Udemy. And if you're going to enroll my courses, you will get 95% discount. Every month, three times. First week, mid of the month, and the last week of the month. I am sharing the coupons. If you go and use those coupons, then my courses related to CCNP, related to CCI, all those courses, you are going to get heavy discount up to 95%. You can see the prices are a little bit higher here, but if you go and apply the coupon, the prices will go rock bottom. So go use those coupons. Suppose if you don't have those coupons, then you can always ping me over YouTube. You can send me email. You can ask for those coupons. I will provide you that coupon. So get the coupon, get the discount. Some of my courses over Udemy, they are bestseller. Some of the courses are quite new, like SD-WAN automation, DNA automation, a CCI data center 3.0. Those are the new uploads as well. So please go continue your learning, take the coupon, enroll my courses, and study well. All the best. Thanks, everyone, for joining enrolling this particular course. This is VMware NSXT version 3.1x. And basically this course I designed just for those who are going to support NSXT operations. So starting with basics that obviously you should know the basics of NSXT and then it will move towards the operation. That means that if you are in an environment where you have NSXT uh, running, deployed and running, and then you have to go and support for the operations. You want to understand the key concepts. What are the things we have inside NSXT and all those things? This course is for you. Okay, so please go watch this complete video series and you will be familiar with NSXT. You will be familiar with the basic concept of NSXT and then you can go and support the operations as well. All right, so let's just stop here and you can continue watch these videos starting with the basics of NSXT. So what are the topics we have that I'm going to cover in this particular course? We have actually total five modules. And in these five modules, you'll see that we'll go and start with the basics of NSXT. That means that what is NSXT? What are the new features? And first of all, suppose if you do not have any knowledge about NSXT, you are very much new to watch this uh, NSXT environment. And in case you know any of the other SDN platform, maybe uh, your background is Cisco ACI, means you are coming from Cisco ACI. You know that how Cisco ACI works. Or maybe you know any other SDN platform, how any SDN platform wo work. That means, you know, maybe Cisco DNA or you may be uh, knowing that uh, how Cisco SD-WAN works. The point being here is this, that this is a type of uh, controller or this is a type of uh, SDN based solution. And when we are talking about SDN solution, and then what is happening at that time is that you have to understand about different type of controllers technology. So you have to understand about uh, what is the management plane, what is the data plane, what is the control plane, policy plane, etc. Now the difficulty here in case of NSXT is this, that uh, this is something that um, that is belonging to VMware and you know that VMware is one of the leading company in virtualization, right? And they have other products as well like vSphere. They have hypervisors, right? So the point being here is this that 
if you know hypervisor if you know that how v sphere is working means how you can go and spin up uh, vms how you can go and create the data centers inside the virtual environment means these are very much prerequisite and i have seen that most of the engineers they directly try to learn nsxt and uh, you know they start losing the grip they start losing the interest because they don't have backup knowledge of basics of vmware okay so in case you if you are trying to learn nsxt directly uh, without any prior knowledge to uh, vmware what is hypervisor technology what is vsphere actually for vsphere 7.0 or 6.7 uh, etc in either six or seven. There are separate courses as well available at various platforms for VMware, basics of VMware. There are separate courses available, I think, in Udemy as well. You can go and check, enroll, and you can learn, gain the knowledge. So if you have that particular knowledge, then you have something. Maybe you have maybe 10 to 15% of prerequisite that you know that, right? Then next thing is this, that if you know basic networking related to data center. See, uh, we know that we have different component in network. We have LAN, we have WAN, and we have data center, right? Now this data center technology that we have, it's quite interesting that inside data center itself, you have different, different type of uh, areas. You have compute, you have a storage, you have a networking, you have security, right? So point being again here is this that if you know basics of networking or basics of data center networking, if you know basics of uh, uh, VMware virtualization technique, then it will be easier for you to start and complete this course. Now, suppose if you don't know the basics and directly you are trying to diving in inside NSXT, then it will be a little bit difficult to understand. Okay, so now you can see that there are three prerequisites uh, that you should have basics of uh, VMware. Again, you will find the videos related to VMware, vSphere, etc. 6.7 or 7.0 anywhere. It is there in YouTube, it is there in Udemy, etc. etc. Right. So you should go and watch, learn this, maybe if you spend four to five hours overall. And if you want to become expert, maybe 10 to 12 hours of virtualization. And then I will show you that where you can go and perform the lab. VMware is providing uh, free lab access to everyone. You can go enroll there and you can do the practice, correct? Then secondly, um, assuming that you know DC networking, and for that, there are so many good Cisco courses available, uh, such as uh, DC Core. You can go and check DC Core courses as well. This is CCNP, up to CCNP level uh, networking inside data center. And then thirdly, if you know or don't know, that's okay because anyways, you are going to learn SDN based architecture and uh, SDN based uh, networking supporting model. So this is not uh, mandatory. Means this you can be uh, this can become as optional. If you know this well and good, if you know ACI or any other data center SDN platform, well and good. Uh, but you should know these two at least. Okay, so in module one, we are going to learn, understand basics of NSXT and their architecture, etc. In module number two also basics, we'll learn the basics and then uh, we'll learn more specific uh, technologies towards NSXT, such as transport node, inventory components, you know, we'll go and check the topology and um, what are the activities we want to do then segments you can see it's advanced and the Geneve protocol how different type of uh, endpoints uh, with uh, what type of encapsulation they have they can go and do the communication then we are going to learn about the routing then we have some 
services as well inside service section you will go and learn about the NAT about the firewall about the gateway firewall and distributed firewall etc again if you move to next level of NSXT this is that we are learning the ABC of NSXT but obviously if you want to learn more and more advanced features and capability by the end of this course I will let you know that what resources you can go and check but you should have the fundamentals first of all you should know the nsxt environment what is nsxt what are the capabilities we have nsxt should have hands-on practice then only we can go and move and we can check the uh, different type of advanced concepts like federation multi-site cloud integration and there are so many things that nsx can nsxt can do and it's capable of all right so these are the topics i'm going to cover uh, let's just stop here. In next section, we'll start with uh, the basics and architecture of NSXT. All right, uh, let's just start our journey. So in this video, we are going to discuss that, okay, we have one data center solution that is nothing but NSXT. Now, NSXT, what is going to solve and what what offering we have with NSXT that other vendors or other product related to data centers and they are they are not providing or maybe they are also providing but uh, why we are going to choose NSXT right uh, we can we can do the comparison but point being here is this that all the SDN solution all the data center SDN solution uh, they will tell you that we are providing uh, anywhere architecture or we are providing uh, policy, automation, visibility, you know, everything. Consistency, you can see here. Uh, you can see here the visibility, security, networking, consistency, each and everything. But isn't that uh, Cisco ACI applica uh, application-centric infra is not... Uh, providing such type of uh, features and solution. The point being here is this, that yes, they are also. But uh, the way NSXT is providing data center automation and uh, data center capabilities is quite unique. First of all, uh, NSX has their own uh, hypervisor, right? They have their own virtualized environment. So you have kind of one framework. And in that framework, you can go and run the compute. And in the same framework, you can go and run the DC services as well. Or you can optimize your DC services, right? So with NSX, NSXT, let me try to write here. Uh, with NSXT, you can go and run the DC services irrespective of uh, you're running those services over hypervisor, containers, bare metal operating system, public cloud. This is quite unique that we have inside uh, NSX. You can think that NSX, uh, it is providing you native data center automation. This is very much software defined native data center solution that we have at present. Although ACI also is a quite capable platform. And uh, if you go and check ACI also, you will find that they also have integration with all type of hypervisors, containers, bare metal, uh, public cloud, etc. But there are few places here you will find that if you have native solution they are much suited in terms of packet filtering in terms of uh, providing firewalling rule to east to west traffic etc in some high level terms but uh, either it's uh, nsxt or any type of data center sgn solution they will claim to provide uh, integration with all sort of uh, all sort of uh, servers either it's a virtual server or a hosted over cloud or bare metal etc 
then they will go and provide you architecture that will be heterogeneous and heterogeneous means again different type of uh, different type of servers or different type of uh, solutions that you can go and integrate with nsxt correct and that will be best suited uh, design uh, management operation etc etc so even SDN solution itself will provide you uh, high visibility, centralized management, centralized control plane, easy to troubleshoot, and all those components that is inherited inside the SDN solution. Now, with different different vendors that is coming with different different type of um, data center solution, how much they are capable of? That's the point being here. So. As an engineer, I have to choose that I want on-prem uh, data center SDN solution or we want uh, that we want to host our uh, data center applications, data center resources over cloud. Again, it's up to us or we want some sort of bridge between in between on-prem to the cloud solution, right? Now, NSXT architecture is going to provide you anywhere architecture concept that means either it's within the data center public cloud bare metal containers everything it will provide you policy consistency network connectivity security services uh, automation api cloud integration and all sort of portfolio right how it is doing because it has well capable software so it has its own hypervisor it has its own framework in terms of vSphere's, and then it has its own software in terms of NSX managers. Okay, later we'll go and check the components of NSX, NSX and NSX manager, or components of NSXT. We'll find that how it is capable of doing all those great things or great, uh, uh, great automations and uh, integrations. We'll check that later on. Now again, uh, we are just checking that what NSXT is going to solve. So it has programmatical interface with various platform as a service, container as a service platform, right? So you have containers such as Kubernetes. You may have um, integration with uh, Pivotal Cloud uh, Foundry, that's PCF. You may have integration with the hypervisors, um, maybe different type of hyper hypervisors like uh, its own ESXi, right? And then KVM or any other type of hypervisor that it can go and integrate with. But not only that cloud it can integrate, it can integrate with the containers as well. And that's the true capability we have with the NSX tree. Okay, so in this summary slide, uh, with NSXT, you have policy and consistency, you have network connectivity, security services, visibility, right? Apart from that, uh, integration, cloud integration, and all those features. Now, I told you that uh, with compared to ACI, there are some features which is quite unique in NSXT, such as in the data plane, it is supporting such, sort, um, um, such a DPDK. Data plane development kit is it's just a concept. It's just a program that will provide you line rate stateful services. So in the data plane, when the when the uh, packets are flowing, right at that time, due to this uh, particular uh, development package or this particular uh, package kit, it is providing line rate speed. And there are some other features as well. You'll find that it's actually hard to deploy in non-native uh, VMware or non-native hypervisor uh, platform that we have in SXT uh, with respect to ACI, such as security features, IPS, IDS features. They can also be integrated inside the other uh, non-NSXT environment, but actually since they are not uh, natively designed for uh, the the solution you can integrate other the solution with those vendors but it is native in nsxt and that's why you'll see that NS, nsxt is booming in the market most of the customers 
um, they are either deploying NSXT or they are thinking uh, to deploy NSXT due to its robust features and capability. All right, let's stop here. In this video, I'm going to explain you about NSXT architecture. Most of the SDN software architecture fall into the same category. So it's not the new type of architecture because again, um, I'm giving lot of, lot of reference related to different type of uh, SGN architecture because if you know one architecture, obviously that same rule applies to other places as well. Okay, so we know that we have management plane in all the SGN, we have control plane and we have the data plane. Now these are the three uh, controllers we have either it's in a box or separate separate controllers it depends upon how different type of vendors they are deploying the stn solution uh, that stn product they are customized into their own product now here you can see that we have something called nsx manager appliance and it's recommended that you should have three in a cluster, right? Because if one will fail, still you have two. If two will fail, still you have one. So you have some sort of redundancy and high ability. So in management plane, you can see that uh, we have uh, three uh, NSX manager appliances. Now these NSX manager appliances, they have some sort of interfaces, okay? So they have open interfaces that you want to connect with cloud, then they have cloud managed platform or integration with cloud. Uh, you, you can think as a interface open to do communication. Maybe you want to do automation, you want to do some third party automation, then you'll find that one integration with uh, will go with the uh, API or third party API, right? Like that you have uh, integration with uh, cloud service manager, you have integration with uh, Container management, this is termed as a NCP, NSX container plugin. And then you have obviously integration with vCenters where you are deploying all these services, all these uh, software, right? So you have management plane, basically um, it will give you all the operation related flexibility, all the, all the management related flexibility, all the third party integration flexibility, cloud integration flexibility, and all those sort of things, right? Great, so that's the use of management plane. Then we have control plane, maintains and propagate dynamic state within the system. Obviously you will learn and know more and more when I'll go and explain you all the components one by one. At the moment, we are just checking the architecture. So you have management plane integrated with control plane integrated with data plane, or you can think that you have three different entities, but obviously they will part of same NSXT architecture. So we have management plane doing all the management stuffs. We have the uh, control plane that will maintain the uh, dynamic state of the system. Again, uh, it will go and do routing and other control related things. We'll discuss later on. And then we have actual data movement inside the data plane. Now you can see here in the diagram, always like you know, mix of so many things, but you can see that you have something called ESXi host. On top of that, you can go and install virtual machines, right? Containers and all services. Or you may supporting multi hypervisor system where you have ESXi, KVM and others as well. Right, it can go and integrate with the bare metal servers as well. So not only VM, but it is supporting bare metals as well. And then you have different type of services or routers like T0 router services. Again, in upcoming section, you will understand about uh, DR and SR means you have distributed routers, service routers, etc. Point being here is this that how we are providing routing from east to waste traffic, not only routing, but security as well, load balancing as well. And then how we are um, communicating with uh, north to south traffic as well. All those things we have 
inside the data plane. Now I told you this is here uh, NSX container plugin. A little bit more about NSX container uh, container plugin or NCP. That um, obviously open interfaces or open API interfaces, so that can go and connect with the Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry adapters, and more NCM infra. Again, uh, this is again the high level. But if you go and see behind the scene, you'll find some more communication and connection inside the uh, inside the architecture now it can go and communicate with the private cloud public cloud so over private cloud also you have all those services over uh, public cloud also you have all the services related to data plane right so those things are always there now in terms of architecture, what we have covered so far, what we have learned so far, that we have the management and control plane. So NSX management appliance, it can go and integrate with cloud, it can go and integrate with containers, it, it should go and integrate with uh, vCenter servers or vSphere's, right? Then we have data plane, we, have, we may have on-prem or we may have uh, services hosted over cloud. In all the cases, you may have multiple hypervisor and different type of guest operating system running on top of that, or maybe different type of containers running on top of that. We may go and integrate with bare metal servers and then services, routings, firewalling, load balancing, IPS, IDS, IPS, and all those services, right? So in upcoming section, we are going to learn more about uh, NSX components, what type of components we have, like what is a centralized control plane or some sort of control is there for the, uh, for the end host as well or to the data plane devices as well. So it has some sort of local control plane as well. But you will understand more about what is transport node, what is transport zone, segments, so many things we have that is going to be um, covered in upcoming sections okay we're going to understand about the tier one and tier zero gateways as well what's the role and principle for those and obviously uh, what type of services we have over the over the edge nodes and as well okay so all these things i'm going to cover in the upcoming section for this section we understood about management plane control plane and data plane. That was the whole idea about this particular video. All right, let's stop here. At this point of time, we understood the overall architecture of NSXT, right? Now in this particular video, we will go and understand more about the use of the components that we have, uh, such as uh, management plane, data plane, control plane, and we have various different components. Now, in this video, I'll go and touch all those important components or ingredients that we have inside the NSX3. Maybe you will not understand all at this point of time, but in upcoming future videos, you will understand the usability of all these components. Now, because in NSX3, we have everything inside same sort of software or hypervisor. So it will be a little bit difficult um, to differentiate that where is your compute, where is your network, where is your virtual switch, where is your routers, where, where, are, your, uh, where are your firewalls, how they are doing the communication and all, right? But over the time period, when we'll go and understand these components one by one, when we'll go and do the labs, one by one, then you'll understand that where exactly routers, switches, firewalls, different services, um, uh, virtual switches, these nodes, these edges, everyone where all these fits in. Okay, so as per the SDN architecture, we have management plane and with that management plane, we can go build the configuration, we can go uh, push the configuration from management plane to control plane and from control plane to data plane, right? The management plane can integrate with NCP, that container plugins we have. It can go and integrate with cloud. It can go and integrate with third-party APIs or it, it is API-aware management plane. Then control plane. Control plane will go and maintain the configuration that you want to push to the 
data plane. So in between control plane and data plane, actually uh, there is two way communication. Data plane, what data plane is doing that they are sharing the topology information or reporting the topology information to control plane. And data plane is maintaining packet level stats. So it is sharing the topology. It, it is parsing the topology and then it is pushing the configuration. So both the control plane and the data plane, actually, they have some sort of intelligence or they have some sort of control. So if you go and check the previous diagram, you'll find that you have control plane and you have data plane here at level of control plane, you have centralized or central control plane. At the level of data plane, you'll find that you have something called local control plane. That means whatever information we are getting from the controllers, we are pushing to the line rate or we are pushing to the data plane and we have that uh, DPDK packages. So LCP is responsible for programming and forwarding entries and the firewall rules of the data plane. Means it has to go and do the installation. It has to go and do the programming in the NSX3 world, world, do the programming for the data plane devices. Okay, so very much we understood management plane, control plane, data plane, components of control plane and data plane in between what is the common thing um, that they are sharing the information and working together. Now data plane, uh, you will find that we have different type of components. And again, while doing the lab, while logging to the NSXT itself, I will show you that we have something called hypervisor transport node. Actually, we have two different types of transport node. One is hypervisor transport node and other is edge node. Remember, we have two different type of components. So once I have my hypervisor, that is the host or ESXi, on top of host, you can go and install VM, right? Likewise, again, you have host or ESXi. And on top of host or ESXi, you have to go and install the edge nodes edge nodes for NSXT services, right? So you have two different type of nodes where exactly you have your VMs and these VMs want to, want to do the networking or communication. So you will go and you will have the logical switch segmentation, etc. I will come to me about that. But we have something called uh, NVDS, your virtual distributed switches, right? With that, these VMs will go and do the communication. Suppose you have the guest operating system or VM web VM app in between they are doing the communication. Then you have different services like you have routing services, firewall services, NAT services and other services that for that you need some sort of different uh, node, different entity and that is nothing but your edge node, right? Remember two type of nodes. One is hypervisor where you have hosted VMware, where you have all the um, all the distributed switches or logical uh, logical frame forwarding, correct? And then you have services uh, where you will install the services over the edge nodes, right? So very important slide this one. NSX manager and use of NSX manager, we know we should have at least three in a cluster for high availability and redundancy. Likewise, we can have the cluster for edge as well. So edge nodes also can be inside the cluster. Uh, so it will also provide you the fault tolerance, etc. External network, internal network, you'll understand about that. So whatever there inside the uh, VMs or within the hypervisor architecture within the NSXT, right? They are your internal network. And when you'll go and communicate to the outside physical world or internet, obviously that will become the external network. So same like we have in our networking, internal and external network. So a physical network or VLAN based network where you want to do the communication with your uplinks or physical links, uh, you'll find your external network. Again, in the lab section, these things will be cleared more and more. Now, one of the a very interesting thing we have is the transport zone. 
again maybe you will not understand the transport zone at the moment fully but don't worry we will understand this more and more in the upcoming section so the transport zone as per definition collection of transport nodes that defines the maximum span of logical switches a transport zone represents a set of similarly provisioned hypervisor and the logical switches that's the definition so as per definition if you want to understand tz transport zone you will understand that these lines so a transport zone represents a set of similarly provisioned hypervisors and the logical switches that connects vm on the hypervisor so you will find that you have your host nothing but your hypervisor you have your vm you have your vms right now these vms they will go and connect with some sort of uh, segments okay and all these communication that is provided by the transport zone again um, it's hard to understand at this point of time but let me see if i have any diagram i can show you that so you will understand the transport zone here you can see again i'll go and cover this transport zone later on as well but you can see that you have host right and you have transport nodes transport nodes who wants to do the communication then you can see that all these transport nodes they are having common segment correct and with this uh, common segment overlay transport zone they can do and uh, they can go and do the communication okay so a transport zone controls which host a segment can reach in a span one or most host cluster okay means it's like see or reach right it's again uh, it's something that it will take time to understand but uh, i will go and fully explain you so it's something like the host can see the segments that's the transport zone for us later on we'll understand more about that but at the moment let's stick with the definition set of similarly provisioned hypervisors and the logical switch okay uh, same hypervisors and the segments these are nothing but logical switch that connects these uh, vms these vms on those hypervisors so three things in the same thing like you have a host same type of host and inside host we have vms and those vms can see which type of segments that's nothing but transport zone okay leave it at the moment if you are not understanding this again i'll come back and try to explain this uh, you will understand via the diagram then what is host transport node at at it is suggesting that host nothing but your hypervisors and then the uh, transport for that right so hypervisor nodes that been registered with nsxt management plane and the nsxt modules install for a hypervisor host to be part of nsxt overlay it must be added inside nsxt5 it's something like your hypervisor or host that is registered to do nsxt functions okay nsxt you have to go and add this transport nodes inside the uh, or your hypervisor inside the nsxt again very com confusing right so so many things we are studying uh, different type of uh, planes then inside the plane itself you have control agent and you have local agent for the uh, for the control right means inside control plane itself you have control plane obviously central control plane and inside the data plane also you have control plane right then you have the hypervisor transport nodes then you have edge nodes this is very much simple i have explained here then how uh, you can go and make the cluster of the management plane you can make the cluster of the control plane you can make the cluster of the, the cluster of the edges edges right nsx edge 
everything you can make as a high availability and redundancy. The different type of network like external network, transport zones and host transport nodes, zone and nodes. See, transport zone, transport nodes. You have to write it actually everything in your notebook to understand the differences and new terms are, are coming. So now we have study about transport node, host transport node. Then you can see the edge transport node. Now, always you can see that two terms are coming, host and then edge. Let me write here, host and edge. And with host itself, we'll find that host transport node, PN, and then you can see edge transport node. Now, host means that your hypervisor. Edge means that NSXT you are installing over hypervisor. Inside host, you will go and install the VM, right? That will provide you compute functions. Inside Edge, you will go and install the NSXT services, or um, you will understand the different type of uh, DR or SR services, or uh, different type of routers we are installing inside the Edge means services. Okay, so like that you can differentiate in between the in between the edge and host, and they can be edge node, they can be transport node. Like that you have to uh, think. So here you can see that NSX edge node where you are installing different type of services for routing and other capabilities. Transport node, uh, nothing but your uh, VMs, and then. And now, whenever we are talking about edge, that means your services, right? Whenever we are talking about host, that means your VM. So edge transport nodes means that you have your uh, services like T0 and T1. Again, in the upcoming section, you'll understand about that. And then you have NSX edge node that is your computational thing. So transport means that although you have your edge, Right, although you have NSXT services, how they can go and do the communication. That's the transport word for you. And then the node word itself is that the uh, compute power. Once you install it, it will become NSXT node. Once you do the communication, it will become the transport node, but you will see that uh, we have different sections there where you have to go and do the configuration. Right now, this is a small video is becoming lengthy, lengthy, and so much confusing. But uh, you can understand there are different terms, and one of the confusing terms we have is the transport zone, transport zone, transport nodes. You can differentiate between host and nodes, and then things will become easier. Host and nodes, and it's 60 services as a node, and compute services as a host everything over ESXi. All right, then profile. Uh, again, you'll find the profile tab. I will go and explain about the profile. Okay, represent a specific configuration that can be associated with the NSX cluster, edge cluster. Again, uh, we will check this later on. Leave it at the moment. Then we have the gateway routers. You'll understand that you can have T0 routers and T1 routers. Again, I will go and explain this in the upcoming section more and more and more about that. But this T0 can be active, active, can be active standby. And in T0 or T1 routers, you can go and install normal routing services. And if you want services, you can go and install the services instance as well, which they can do both. And this is also means the T1 also can do the distributed routing and the service routing capabilities like NAT and firewalling, et cetera, et cetera. Again, you'll understand more about that in upcoming section and they can spin up only as the active standby. Here you can see T0 routing, okay, active standby, active, active. And T1 uh, routing, you'll find that they can do uh, active standby part of cluster. Again. If you are able to do everything via the T0, no need to go and install uh, T1 below it. But you will see that we need T1 because we we are connecting different type of logical segments to the T1. So T1 become gateway, and then you have the routed link 
in between T0, T1, and then you, it will it will go and connect with the external world like that. The logic is there. Again, you will understand this more and more in the upcoming section. Then we have the logical switch. We have discussed about the segments and the NVDS in the previous section. In case of uh, ESXi, we have NVDS. And in case of uh, KVM, you have open virtual switch, right? Then final term we have is the overlay network. Again, I will go and explain you about overlay network as well. But it is using, so logical network implemented using layer two in layer three tunnel. It's like L2 within L3 tunnel and how the Geneve protocol will come into the picture, how encapsulation, decapsulation will happen in tunnel, how the packet forwarding hap happening in the tunnel, everything I'm going to explain. Uh, we have dedicated videos for that. In this section, we are only understanding that what are the components we have actually you know these are the components we have and the confusing ones transport zone and then the host transport and the ace transport etc etc right you have to understand those terminology first before diving deep inside the nsxt then obviously if you are connecting to the physical network you need physical interfaces so that uh, t0 routers that we have if they are communicating to the outside world then obviously they need some sort of a physical nick when we are talking about vmware flat vmware machines so they have something called vnic that is the vmware interface like in my laptop also uh, if i go and connect any any physical interface that will be my physical interface for my laptop like that in all the VMs you have the VNIC and then the VNI terms. VNI terms mostly going to be used when we are doing overlay communication. So your packets will get encapsulated inside inside obviously in, in Geneve encapsulation where we are going to use the VNI more and more. Again, I will go and explain about VNI in upcoming uh, section. The final key term we have is the tunnel endpoint. So whenever we'll do the communication between one VM to other VM, um, we'll do the encapsulation and decapsulation and we'll see the use cases as well. And then you are creating some sort of tunnel in between, the tunnel endpoint with a Geneve encapsulation. And you are doing the communication uh, within the fabric. So within the fabric, two different VMs, they will go, they will create the tunnel endpoints. They will create the tunnel and do the do the communication. That is layer two encapsulated inside layer three, uh, layer two in layer three tunneling. Okay, and th that will become the part of TEP. Again, we'll understand more about the TEP because the whole course, whole fabric uh, lies inside the tunnel endpoints. Oh, so, so many terms, terminology, right? So actually, this is the summary of what we are going to learn, understand in the upcoming uh, section, upcoming classes. So maybe I haven't explained all those terms in, uh, in, in, you know, in a way that you should make notes and uh, this will stick for future references. My main goal for this particular video was just to understand what components we have. And in upcoming section, we'll go and check each components and their use cases and lab associated with that. And then again, if you, after completion of this course, if you come back to this particular video, you will understand everything that whatever I explained so far. All right, let's just stop here. As previous video was too long, it was approximately 20 minutes long. So what I have done for this video, I'm going to cover just one slide. In this video, we are going to discuss that new features introduced inside NSX 3.1.x. Okay. So let's see that uh, what are the features, new features we have inside NSXT. You can see that now, not only that, uh, it was earlier supporting IDS, but it will go and support IB, IPS as well, Intu intuition protection system. What does it mean? That not only it will go and generate the logs when it will find any anomaly, but it, it can go and take action as well. So action thing is inside IPS. It will go and 
reset the setting, it will go and drop the connection lines, etc. So action word is there inside IPS that will that is introduced in the new code. Then single manager with vSphere HA means if you want some smaller production deployment, it will go and support that. Otherwise, a previous section you will see that is it's required that you should have three managers inside a cluster and all. Then it has nice UI user interface. Now it is supporting dark mode and most of our lab we are going to perform in the dark mode because it will be easier to see it. Obviously for eyes, it's it looked pretty. Then we have custom role-based access control. Now we have flexibility that how we are creating our RBAC, different privileges for different, different uh, users or accounts. Migration become easier. So if you want to migrate uh, NSX for vSphere in environment, we have VRA, we realize automation. With that, uh, we can do the migration and we can get migrated from NSX for vSphere to NSXT. Okay. And you know that NSXT, they are supporting all sort of workload, either it's the virtual or container or bare metal. Finally, the license entitlement to use a VDS for NSXT data center uses, uh, uses means uh, inside license also, we have improvement migration also. You can see the improvement for RBAC also, we have improvement, then UI get improved. Uh, for a smaller deployment, it is supporting and it is supporting for advanced level security as well in terms of IPS. All right, so these are the new features introduced uh, inside NSX 3.1.x. What about this dark theme and all? When I log into the NSX, I'll show you that on top you have the option that you can go and change the modes. All right, let's just stop here. From this video onwards, you can go and stitch together all the concepts that we have discussed in our previous 20 minute video that uh, where is your T0, where is your T1, what is your segment or logical switch, how they are connecting or communicating, then where is your physical link, where is your transport nodes, where is your transport, host transport node, uh, where is your edge cluster, where is your edge installed, all those things one by one, one by one, you can go and correlate from the lab and the upcoming section onward. So from here itself, from this diagram itself, you can see that first of all, we have two reason. So reason for compute, reason zero, uh, reason one, A01, edge zero one, right? So uh, this is the reason name. We can give any logical name. Again, it depends upon region A, region B, region C. Same same uh, regions we have compute sections. Uh, we have edge sections as well. Now, these compute and edge, actually inside this, we have group of same type of host or ESXi, right? So here I have ESXi 1A, ESXi 2A. Right over one A, we have uh, VMs. We have VM install app one, web one, DB one. So all these VMs, three VMs, they belongs to same ESXi or instantiated or running over same ESXi. And then for other ESXi, we have web two A. Just for example, right? So this is our compute. Uh, instance, this is one of the group where uh, we have a group of uh, ESXi, where we have group of VMs running over different, different ESXi, easy, right? Now you can compare with this and this with the host and the host node that we have discussed in our previous uh, 20 minute video. Now, next part, where exactly you have your NSXT installed and components of NSXT installed, right? So we have other grouping that is falling under region A, 01, edge 01, where again we have two hosts. 
थ्री ए एंड फोर ए ई एस एक्स थ्री ए ई एस एक्स फोर ए नाउ हेयर वी हैव टू क्लस्टर फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल सी द क्लस्टर दीज आर नथिंग बट एज क्लस्टर सो वी हैव एज क्लस्टर वन वी हैव एज क्लस्टर टू राइट एंड ओवर दीज एज क्लस्टर्स वी हैव इंस्टॉल्ड द सर्विसेस सो वी हैव सर्विसेस कॉल्ड एज नोड वन ए टू ए थ्री ए फोर ए right so now you can understand that uh, you have your edge cluster so where exactly your edge cluster is and inside that edge cluster you have edge node correct so we have two edge node here we have two edge node here here in this diagram you have something called host obviously these are the host and then you have host nodes or host vms so like that you can correlate then again the same thing that we have the uh, grouping uh, different regions are grouped inside that we have the uh, different esxi okay and inside uh, this particular region edge that we have again we have edge cluster inside that edge cluster we have edge nodes okay how the topology look like so now in this diagram you can see that you have logical segment for web app and db for those different logical segments we have different type of networking 172.16.10.0.20.0.30.0 and obviously these vms are 10.11 10.11 20.11 etc then here you can see that we have something called t0 routers sorry this is not t0 okay here in this case we have t0 that's right but it may be like this say t0 routers going to the outside world and we have extension of this uh, lab as well where i will show you t0 and t1 as well in this diagram it is showing only t0 and then you have bottom router t1 as well let me try to draw here and this t1 the thing that this is t1 and then the you have t0 and then you have connection with outside world and then t1 having gateway for different type of logical segments related to web app and db now if it is not required that uh, you don't need t1 anymore directly you can connect with the logical segments that you can see in this diagram that's fine but most of the deployment you will find that you have dedicated t0 as a gateway router and then you have uh, t1 okay uh, that will mostly control the east to west traffic handling and uh, t0 is there that will provide you gateway routing plus some sort of firewalling as well all right so this is the logical topology we have we are going to work on this in upcoming section let's stop here we are about to start our lab section and in the lab section again we'll go and learn uh, the components that we have discussed the the architecture design that we have discussed in our previous section so whatever we learn in our previous videos previous sections uh, we'll go and discuss more and more uh, in the lab section as well and we'll try to match up whatever theoretical concepts we learn try to match up with the uh, with the configuration with the with the hands on lab or the practice sessions okay now where you can go and book your lab so vmware they are providing hol hands on lab site now this hol actually they have um other url you can see pathfinder.vmware.com here you can go and search for hol hands on lab means once you are in this particular place you can go and search there are more than 140 different type of labs available in uh, different vmware technologies there you can go and search nsxt and then you will get uh, multiple labs related to nsxt you can go and reserve once you go and reserve that particular lab you will allow to access that lab for 90 minutes and even you can go and extend for 60 60 minutes as per your requirement 
So in the upcoming section, I will go and reserve the lab over HOL and then we'll perform the lab task. We'll, uh, we'll perform the lab task parallelly. We'll understand the theoretical concepts as well. Now, in any case, if you want to build your own home lab, obviously you need good amount of compute and resources. And you can go and check this particular uh, website or blog site. Uh, you can go and check a step by step. Uh, you'll find that actually it's easy that you can go and build the lab as well if you have proper compute uh, with yourself. Now, the licensing part. Uh, for students or for the lab practice also, VMware providing uh, some licenses. If you are constantly developing a VMware community, uh, you are actively pa participating in there. Then they will provide you community community license as well that you can use for your lab practices. Okay, so yeah, uh, if you want to build your lab, obviously you need license and VMware is providing license. Maybe they will charge you um, 1000 USD plus, or if we have community license in that case, it will be free. Um, you can search more on that. HL reference hands on lab reference uh, lab and what type of labs you have. You can check this link as well. There are different labs, list of list of labs are there. You can go and check. I'm going to log into Pathfinder and you can see the Pathfinder. And then I will go and search NSXT. Once I have that, you can go and start your lab. It will be there for 90 minutes. Means this lab activity will take 150 minutes, but there are different, different labs and whatever learning objectives you can see here. There's the same we have in our agenda as well that we have discussed earlier, okay? So please go book your lab inside HOL. It will give you quick access. You don't need any type of uh, uh, corporate URL or anything. With your Gmail account itself, you can book the lab and you can practice it. All right, so let's stop here. Welcome back, everyone. In this particular section, I'm going to log into the HL lab and I will show you few of the options there. And we are going to discuss about transport zones and host transport nodes, where all these components you can go and see and the usability. Again, I told you earlier in previous section that uh, we are going to repeat these terms until unless um, you will understand this fully. You should understand the concept because this is a new domain. Uh, means if you're coming from Cisco ACI or Cisco World to VMware. So here you have a software which is doing all of these amazing tasks. Okay. Now, so once you log into HL Lab, uh, you can open that Chrome is there. If you go and open, you'll find that you have option that you can log into the NSX manager. I'm going to log in there. I will show you in a while. You can log in, you can go to the dashboard and we have theme as well. You can make this dark theme as well. You can go to the system. You can check the appliances uh, in the appliance, appliances. You can go and check the uh, load memory and all those hardware related information. Apart from that, what services are running. So you can go and check the controller and manager services. You'll find they're up and running, okay? Then you can see that you have the fabric tab here. If you go and click to the fabric tab, you can see the node, nodes, host, profile, transport zones, compute manager, etc. Once you are there inside the node section, so you can see the node tab. And again, I will log in and I'll show you that. You have different options there related to nodes, right? So what these nodes are doing, these nodes, these transport nodes are hypervisors, means software that has been prepared with NSX software components. Means hypervisors on top of that, you have the packages, NSX software package that will allow the VM machines that is running over compute, right? So that will allow the VM machines on those hypervisors access to NSX services. So. VM machine also running over compute, right? So on, over the compute, you have VM machines and these VM machines will go and use this transport nodes 
actually the NSXT hosted services over the edge nodes, right? Edge nodes that can go and use those services. Now the NSXT edge nodes, which services they are uh, hosting, they can have uh, segmentation, they can have routing, they can have firewalling, etc. Obviously we are going to learn more and more about that, but you should know these terms. Then we have the profile tab as well. You can see that we have profile tab as well. Profile tab means that how you want to uh, communicate with uh, uh, VLAN segments or any overlay segments. So you can go and create one sort of uplink profile. So uplink profile we are creating what this uplink profile is telling that you may have active active scenario or you may have active and a standby, a standby profile or scenario. So you can see that I have two profile here in the diagram, uplink profile UP1, that is active active, and then UP2 is their active and failover associated with different VLAN. Correct, so in this diagram, you can see that you have your transport nodes, you have your distrib uh, distributed virtual switch, you have your policy, inside the profile and then you are going communicating with the external network or physical network okay again when i go and do all these things within the lab you will understand more about this now coming back to transport zones so transport node transport zones we have discussed this about uh, in in our previous section as well let me tell you more about uh, transport zones one more time because this is actually a very important thing. You should know this going forward. It will help us to understand uh, the NSXT more and more. So layer two broadcast domain in NSXT environment are called segments. Okay, you can see that you have segment in the diagram. Now these segments are created as part of NSXT object called transport zone so they are they are one type of object uh, and they are part of transport zone now what is happening with this segment and this transport zone so transport zone controls which host segment can reach it can span up to one or most host cluster so where to where the communication will happen that's the responsibility or that's the uh, that's the programming you can say within a transport zone because there is one object segment and it can be span across multiple host cluster, right? So different VMs, how they will go and do the interaction, the transport zone will provide you that capability. And not only the VLAN segment, in the upcoming section, you will understand that uh, we can have integration with the existing network, or you can say the legacy network as VLAN segment, or we can have the overlay segments, or we'll see overlay network, where you are using some sort of tip tunnel endpoint to do the communication. So all the places you will see the transport zones will come into the picture. So transport zones, they will go and do the communication within the VMs, they will provide you that uh, logical switch or the segmentation. Apart from that, the transport zones define a collection of hosts that can communicate across uh, a physical network using tunnel endpoint. Okay, so you will see that not only the legacy or VLAN segment, but it will provide the communication over the uh, over the uh, separated VMs over uh, with respect to physical, um, you know, physical connectivity or physical uh, network infrastructure. Meaning is that from one VM, you are going somewhere out to some physical network and then you are connecting with the other VM. In between that, obviously you have some sort of tunnel. We'll, we'll understand this more and more, but transport zone will provide you that as well. So what I'm going to do here, I will log into the uh, NSX manager and then I will show you that inside notes section, you can go and check the host transport nodes, edge transport nodes, edge cluster is also there. These things you will see. This is the dark theme and uh, we can see the host transport node. Once I log in, I will show you that. 
and then we can go and check the so here you can say that host transport node something is configured means we can run the nsxt services something is not configured that means we can't run the nsxt services and about the cluster and how these hosts are located inside that cluster we know that right so i will log in there to the lab and I will show you all these options that we have. So you can see that clearly we have host, right? And then we have edge. Now with the edge itself, you can see that you have edge trans host transport node, right? And then you have something called edge transport node as well. All right, so let me quickly show you the lab section inside HUL. And seems that it is time out return to your lab. Because once you will not uh, log in for maybe two, three minutes, it will idle time out. And uh, it will not allow you to do the access. So what you need to do that you can go and rerun it. On top, you can see the timer is going on. Still, I have one hour, 13 minute left. If I go there and click extend, and this time will get extend for one hour. And you can do this for multiple hours. It depends that if uh, lab is available, if resources are free, then uh, VMware will give you that uh, access or flexibility that you can go and use this particular lab. Great. So let this lab give some time. It is still spinning up. You can see generally it will be faster than this. Uh, so you can go and uh, do your lab practices. So I'm going to wait for a couple of more seconds till we get the lab access. And then I will show you that where you can go and check the, uh, first of all, the uplines setting and then the fabric and node setting. All right, let's wait. So we are inside the HUL lab. And here you can see that you have this console. You can go to this particular console. And uh, let me expand this. You can see here that you have reason A. Click there. Log in to this NSXT dashboard. And on top, you can see that you have the theme as well. You can change the theme. And I like dark theme. Uh, so I will make this dark. Then we can go and click to the systems. Uh, once you click to the system, inside the system, you can go and check the appliances. So let me go and click to the appliances. And it's uh, stable, it's going good. I can uh, scroll a little bit down to this because uh, you can go and check the details as well. So here you can see that you have view details because you want to see that the control manage policy, those services are up and running. So that's very much good. I can close this particular page here. We can click expand to the fabric. And once we are inside the fabric, we can go and click to the nodes. In the node section, you can see on the top that we have this uh, transport node. We have other options as well. Let me highlight it. So here you can see that you have this transport node, you have edge transport node, edge cluster, ESXi bridge, NCP cluster, right? Now, what I want to do here that I simply want to add this host transport node. So in the drop down menu here, where we have the standard host, you can see that we have the vSphere client address. I can go click this add. It is applied and here you can see that we have multiple clusters here. We have region A edge inside that edge. We know that what ESXi we have, we have discussed this earlier. So let me expand this 
and you can see that we have ESXi or host uh, three and four. And then let me expand this compute region as well. So here you can see that we have uh, one A and two A where we have different VMs. Here in three and four A, we have something called edge, edge nodes, right? Now I can go and click to the edge transport node and inside edge transport node also, you can see that you have edge node one, two, three, four, as per our document, you can refer the document. And you can see inside one and two, the edge cluster one and edge cluster two it is showing up and running and nothing is there in three and four, that's okay. We'll check that later on as well. And here inside the uh, region one A edge, you can see that uh, the services are not configured, not available, etc. right? So you can check the status of services as well. Later on, we'll check more about this particular uh, section about that. Apart from that, you can see that you have the edge cluster option as well. You can see that you have option for ESXi bridge cluster and NCP cluster as well. So like that, we are going to continue and perform different, different lab tasks in the upcoming section. For this video, uh, we are very much done. Let us, let's, let us stop here. Slowly, we are understanding the components of NSXT. We are understanding the key concepts, whatever we have inside NSXT. In a similar fashion, same line, we can go and understand the uplink profile as well. And what are the things that we can go and do create inside uplink profile? Now in this particular section, not only uplink profile, but I'm going to discuss a little bit about VDS or NVDS as well, because we know that we should have a communication channel and NVDS, this distributed switch, actually they are providing the communication in between so in between the virtual machine, that's point one, or between the internal component to the physical network. And you can think this in, in a manner that uh, within VM to VM, that means you have east to west communication. And for that, uh, you have distributed switches, virtual distributed switches, or maybe these VMs, they want to go and talk to the outside world with the physical interface. Again, I will go and explain more about this communication as well in the upcoming slide. Okay, now you can see here that in the later case, the NVDS must own one or more physical interfaces. And example for that, that if you have the connection with the physical interface, let me quickly show you that diagram first, and then I'll come back here you will understand this 100%, uh, no problem on that. So from this diagram, you can see that I have NVDS, and then you can see uplink one and uplink two. One of the uplink, you can see it is attached with two of the physical interfaces. So P1, P2, P3 are the PNICs, physical NICs of the hypervisor itself. You have the host, right? That's the hypervisor. Those hypervisors, they have three different interfaces. In this case, say P1, P2, P3, this interface, P1, P2, P3, right? Now they are mapped with NVDS uplink. So you have your virtual switch and with this virtual switch, you'll find that they are mapped with, right? And how they are mapped? So U1, U2, uplink one and uh, uplink two are the uplinks of the uh, virtual distributed switch, you when uh, they are defined as a lag building for uh, the physical interfaces for the host, that is P1 and P2. And then UT is directly mapped with the P3. It's, it's very much clear from this diagram that this is this uh, host interface, physical host interface is mapped with the NVDS uplink. And this uh, physical interface is mapped with the other other uplink uh, that we have NVIDIA. So it's actually mapping between NVIDIAs to the host physical interfaces. If we have type two type of communication like internal system, they want to communicate with the external network. 
right? Now here you can see that uh, NVDS is mandatory with NSXT for both overlay, and this is important. We have two type of network here. Uh, we have overlay communication and we have uh, VLAN based networking. Now there is difference between the VLAN based segment and overlay backed segment. Here you need some sort of tip. Again, you'll understand more about these terms in upcoming section as well. And I have dedicated slide that you'll understand that how with help of Geneve encapsulation, uh, tip endpoints, different VM uh, hosted over different host, they can go and create these tunnels and they can do the communication. Now, in case of uh, traditional network, and that is nothing but your VLAN based segment. Uh, let, let me give you the definition for that. So VLAN backed or based segment is a layer two broadcast domain that is implemented as a traditional VLAN in a physical uh, infrastructure. That means that they should match with some sort of VLAN. That means the traffic between two VMs on two different hosts, but attached within same VLAN. And that's the key here. They're attached with the same VLAN segment. So here in one VM, you have VLAN 20 other VM hosted over other host also, they also have VLAN 20. A straightforward, right? A VLAN based segment. You have common segment, you have common VLAN in between the segment, so different VMs can do the communication. Overlay segment, again, we are going to discuss more about that. Uh, we need to create some sort of tunnel in between them and those are the tunnel endpoint. Uh, again, we'll discuss more and more about that, but uh, they, they will do some sort of encapsulation, decapsulation to do the communication. Now this section, since we have started, the section topic is to understand the uplink profile, but within that, we understood about the usability of NVDS. We understood that uh, different type of network we have, actually different type of communication we have, overlay communication and VLAN-based networking communication, right? Uh, it will come more and more in the upcoming sections as well. But let us focus more on the uplink versus uh, physical NIC and this step this example I have already told you that uh, the NVDS uplink is going to map with the actual physical link that you have for the host or the hypervisor, okay? And then for that particular mapping, uh, what are the policies we can go and create? That I'm going to tell you. So we may have the failover order. Failover order, uh, that means that what you want? Active, active, active standby. And this I'm going to log into the uh, NSX and I will show you that. Let me quickly see if I have the NSXT here. Okay. So here you can see, if you go to system, if you go to profile, inside profile, you can see that I have one of the uplink uh, profile here. If I go and click there, you can see that compute uplink profile. Inside that compute uplink profile, the name, the description and then transport VP, VLAN is zero, that's okay. MTU is 1600, that's the global MTU. We haven't configured the lag, uh, lag LACP mode, LACP load balancing, etc. This is a link aggregation. Uh, that we haven't uh, configured, but teaming policy, you can see that um, uh, we are using some sort of default teaming, which is doing load balancing as a source ID. There are actually two type of methods for teaming policy. If I go click add here, so I can show you that uh, we have teaming policy, load balancing source, load balancing source Mac. What does it mean by uh, source and source uh, Mac? I will show you in the slide. Okay, and then you can see here, let me cancel it. The, active uplinks, uplink one and uplink two. That's very much okay. Let's go back to the slide section. So here you can see in the slide that uh, the load balancing method we have two, right? One is uh, load balance source and other is load balance MAC address. What, uh, what does it mean by this? 
and it's very really straightforward. Definition is a straightforward. Load balance source MAC address is a little bit granular. Uh, it has some more control while you are uh, choosing that uh, link A versus link B or uplink A versus uplink B. So let's try to understand. The load balance source flavor makes one-to-one -one mapping between the virtual interfaces and an uplink of the host. And you can think like this here, NVDS uplink and your physical interfaces like P1, P2, etc., whatever we have actually present in the host. Traffic sent by this interface will leave the host through the uplink only and the traffic destined for this virtual interface will necessarily enter the host via this, which is like one-to-one -one mapping. So one uplink mapped with one of the physical link. That is nothing but source balanced, load balance source. But in case of load balance source MAC address, it is a little bit more granular. What is happening in this case is this, and it's very interesting, that virtual interfaces that can source traffic from different MAC addresses, means on the basis of different MAC addresses, two frames sent by the same virtual interface could be pinned to different host uplinks based on their source MAC address. So as per the source MAC address, it, it can go to P1 or it can go to P2, okay? So on basis of MAC addresses, and here you can see in the diagram that you have, uh, let me go with failover me mechanism and then I'll tell you the source port, but uh, we don't have um, source load balancing uh, with respect to MAC ID here, but you will understand more. So first use case, the failover, obviously the one is your primary and other one is your secondary. And clearly you can see here that primary and this is primary and secondary. Secondary that is not sending anything from the uplink. So V1 uh, virtual machine P1 is pinned to physical interface P1 and you have two physical interfaces P1 and P2. Even VM2 is also pinned to uh, P1, right? because one is primary, other one is secondary. This is the failover mechanism. We can have active-active both. There is no problem with that. Now, in case of load balancing source port, source ID, what we are doing, that uh, U1, so VM pin to U1, VM pin, uh, VM2 pin to, like here it is pinned in this direction, here it is pinned in this direction. Nothing much brainer, right? We can go and do the configuration. Oops, configuration like this. Now, if you go to uplink profile that I have shown you there in the NSXC, you can go to compute if you want to see the detail about that. So you can check the MTU, you can check the name, description, trans transport VLAN is zero. So deeming, deeming policy is failover order like primary and secondary. And we have active uplinks, primary and secondary. You may have active, active. There's no problem on that. So one other example that is there as a NSX default uplink host switch profile. And if I go there, I can show you that as well. So let's quickly go to the NSX key here. You can see that um, NSX default load balancing host switch profile. And here you can see that active, let me show you, differences are there. I can click here to select this. If I can show you, see the active links, it has uplink one, two, three, four. These are active. All four physical, all uplinks are active actually, mapped to one of the link, maybe P1, and there is no standby like that. You can go and check other uh, profiles as well. Okay, so here you can see that uh, active and a standby uplink one and uplink two. Here we have the lag configuration source and destination number of link. Uh, so there are one, two, three, four, five, five default configurations as well related to profile. We can go and check these default configuration as well. And um, as per the requirement, we can uh, replicate the same configuration in our infra as well.
all right so i hope that you understand um, concepts here related to uh, different different uh, terminologies related to uplink profile obviously we understood that nvds why explain um, why i have explained nvds here because you should understand this diagram so nvds uh, the uplink is somehow mapped with the physical link so uplink of nvds mapped with the physical interface of the host right and then you can do some sort of uh, north to south or south to north uh, communication all right so we learned a few concepts here it's time to stop here let's stop here Hi there, thanks for your enrollment. We are in one minute ad break. In this break, I'm going to show you that I have so many courses uploaded over Udemy. And if you're going to enroll my courses, you will get 95% discount. Every month, three times. First week, mid of the month, and the last week of the month. I am sharing the coupons. If you go and use those coupons, then, my courses related to CCNP, related to CCI, all those courses, you are going to get heavy discount up to 95%. You can see the prices are a little bit higher here, but if you go and apply the coupon, the prices will go rock bottom. So go use those coupons. Suppose if you don't have those coupons, then you can always ping me over YouTube, you can send me email, you can ask for those coupons, I will provide you that coupon. So get the coupon, get the discount. Some of my courses over Udemy, they are bestseller. Some of the courses are quite new like SD-WAN automation, DNA automation, a CCI data center 3.0. Those are the new uploads as well. So please go continue your learning, take the coupon, enroll my courses and study well. All the best. Welcome back everyone. Now this section is very important because in this particular section, I'm going to explain you over the dashboard that uh, uh, what are these items? Although we have discussed about what is transport zone, what is host transport zone node, all these uh, terms we have discussed in our previous section, right? Now in this section, one by one, I will go log into the NSXT dashboard. And then I'm going to show you that how you can uh, check these items, how you can go and create as well. Now coming back to transport zone, uh, it's a critical piece here uh, we have in NSXT and we should understand it. So we know that inside transport zone, uh, we have one object called segment. Now, if multiple VMs, they will go and share the same segment, that means they will communicate, right? And that's the importance we have with the transport zone. So for example, if we have DMG transport zone, that means what will happen that uh, all the hosts connected in that DMG zone, they will do the communication, right? That's the easiest, uh, 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 analogy or that's the easier, easiest definition we can tell. Now, apart from that, I will show you some other uh, items in trees as well that you will understand the use usability of uh, the transport zone and uh, in terms of edge and host. Now, going further in this, you will see that uh, these transport zones, either they can VLAN based or segment based, right? So VLAN based segment that we have discussed in our previous section, or they can have overlay. And this thing um, we have discussed that if it is overlay, that means the tunnel endpoints will form and they, then they will do the communication. Again, in upcoming section, I will show you the pictorial explanation of this. In a diagram, I'll show that how everything is happening in upcoming slides. Now, if you are connecting your NSXT environment with uh, existing VLAN based network or the traditional network, so in that case, you have to go and use the VLAN segment. This also we have discussed earlier, 
right? So that means we can go and create two type of overlay. We can go and create overlay in terms of uh, overlay, right? Means two transport zone in terms of overlay and in terms of uh, VLAN. And you will see that I will log into the device and I will show you that. Let me go to the next slide. Let me clean this stuff first. All right, let's go to the next. So what you can do, you can go to the node. So we have the, oops, we have the system and then you can see you have the fabric and just below the node, you can see that we have transport zone option. You can go and click to the uh, TZ transport overlay. Even we can go and create as well. So creation, uh, I will show you that how you can do it. And once you click there, you can check the overview. So how many transport nodes it is connected. Even I can go and click to the transport nodes. We can see that how many switches, logical switches, how many ports it is connected. So let me quickly go there to the NSX. And uh, you can see here that uh, we have the system. Let me clean the stuff here. So here you can see that we have system. We can go to the systems and you can see I can expand this fabric and below that profile you can see that we have transport zone option. Once we are inside the transport zone you can see that we have in this lab we have uh, overlay TZ transport zone and uh, VLAN based. In our case we have total six transport nodes two switches and five switch port if we can go and click to the transport nodes you can see that we have all these six transport nodes here, uh, edge node one, two, three, four, and then uh, ESXi one and two, where we have the VMs. So these are the services, right? Over the edge node, we are installing the ESXi services. And over these uh, ESXi hosts that we have, ESXi one A and two A, where we have web and app and DV VMs. So all these web and app, using the transport zone, that's the overlay, they can communicate uh, with the services, right? So that's the one usability we have. If you go and click edit here, you will uh, come to know about the name, location, description, traffic type is overlay, etc. Now, in any case, if you want to create your own, so you can go and create your transport zone. And here you can see that we have option either overlay or VLAN. Like that, we can go and create, we can go and give the uplink teaming policy name as well, right? Likewise, you can see that if we have VLAN based segment, so there also you can see that uh, uh, VLAN based segment is there and then switch, whichever switch is connected with that. And then you can see that uh, switch ports. So all informations we have, right? Great, at the moment, let me go and close this because we already have this uh, transport zone created. Now where we can call this transport zone, I will show you, okay? So I hope you understand the concept of transport zone. We, we have discussed a lot about that, where you have the segments connected, where you have your VMs, where you have the services, everything is there uh, actually glued inside the uh, transport zones, okay? Now the next topic, very important topic we have is the host transport node. Now this host, host means ESXi, right? And then uh, glued with the transport nodes means how the host, they are doing the transportation. We will understand this. Now host transport node, they can be individual. Individual means that uh, um, only one host is there and that is connected with uh, different type of uh, uplink profiles, right? So here you can see that uh, this configuration is applied to each standalone host. That's the name individual, right? In the fabric. And it is used for KVN and non V center managed V spare hypervisors. So suppose if you have other hypervisors, so in that case, individual transport node, inside that you have the individual option that will come into the picture. Suppose if you have other hypervisors in case uh, NSXT supporting KVM hypervisors. So that will be used here, right? In our lab, most of the time we are going to use the transport node profile, right? The, this transport node profile, 
you will see i will log into the system i'll show you that so this transport node profile allow you to define the configuration for host at a v center cluster level so what does it mean it means simply that you can apply this policy to the cluster and whatever members we have inside the cluster they will be automatically receiving those configuration right so that's the meaning of this apply the uh, rule to the cluster and all the members will get it so i will go and i will show you that inside the node uh, inside the profile i will go and show you that we have a transport node profile so we'll go to the profile inside that we have transport node profile i will log into uh, i will click edit to this uh, uh, tnp transport node profile and we'll go and see the characteristics that we have inside that then i'll come back to the slide okay so let's go back here to the dashboard. We can go to the profile. So let me click to the profile. And on top here, you can see that we have transport node profile. And once we are inside the transport node profile, I can select this. Uh, once you can select this, then you can click uh, edit. This pencil icon is there. You can click this pencil. And now you can see that name is comp. Uh, a transport node profile transport node profile for the vcenter cluster uh, reason a that's okay now switch and i will give you the notes about this vds nowadays nsxt they are using vcenter distributed switch and that's why we have this selection vds what does it mean by EN ens interrupt uh, uh, i will explain you in this slide so here you can see that the transport zone we have overlay transport zone Okay, because we want to create the tip tunnels as well. That's why we have this overlay. And just now inside the uh, inside the transport zones, we have discussed about this overlay. Then uplink profile, we have discussed about uplink profile as well and how this, uh, this uplink profile, this U1s, U2s, they are mapping with P1, P2, et cetera. We have discussed in our previous section, right? Likewise, you can see that we have the TEP assignment. And for TEP assignment, uh, what pool we are using, I will show you that. That is the recent tip pool. I will log into the network addresses. I will show you this as well. And then we have the uh, VDS uplinks, uh, uplink one and two. Okay. So this is actually a transport node profile. And let me go to this slide deck. So you have the transport node profile and the important part I have highlighted here in the red that is starting with NSXT 3.0. It is possible to run NSXT software components directly on native vSphere VDS, right? And that's why we have selected the VDS. This is native for vSphere uh, VDS. Version must be at least 7.0. You must be running vCenter 7.0 software. And this method is recommended for all the new deployments. Then we have other option like enhanced network stack ENS also appears uh, as ENS data path is a networking stack mode that will provide you superior network performance when configured and enabled for optimized Intel NIC. Okay, and it is primarily utilized for network function virtualization workloads. So if you need superior optimized data path, then we can go and use ENS uh, requiring that what type of hardware requirement it has. Okay, so inside that, if you go and scroll, I have shown you that, so transport zone, we are using overlay. Then we have the uplink profile that is compute uplink profile. Then we are using the TEP address. I will show you this inside this TEP address, uh, so you can go to the networking and the address pool and you can go and verify your TEP address as well. So let me quickly go and let me quickly show you that how you can go and check this TEP addresses as well. Even you can go and create your addresses as well. So I can go click to the networking. In the bottom, you can see we have IP address pool. Inside IP address pool, you can see that we have one regional TEP pool. We can go and check. So here you have three dots, right? You can click to these three dots, click edit, and you can verify that, okay, this is the name, that's the description. And uh, here you can see that subnet is one. You can click to the subnet. And the IP address we are using for this TEP is 
one three zero four one. I will come back to this particular IP address in later examples, in later exercises, and uh, you will see that it is assigned. So this IP address is getting assigned from the uh, from this particular pool. So from forty one up to seventy one, we have the uh, TEP pool range. All right, so. Let's break this particular section into multiple sections, at least two sections. Let's just stop here. And in the next section, we'll go and discuss the remaining part of the task. Let us complete our section where we left off in the previous section. So what we have done, and again, you can go and have a revision that we have checked various things related to transport nodes, and we have checked the uh, tab pool as well. We have checked the profile as well. Now in this section, what we want to do that uh, we will go and check the host and edge transport node configuration. We'll go and verify the cluster as well. And we'll go and create one more cluster. Okay. All these slides here, you can go and refer the slide. You can go to the system and the nodes, fabric nodes, and you can check that uh, your host transport node is configured and it is attached with this uh, TNP transport node profile that we have checked in our previous video. You can refer that video as well. Then we can go and check the edge transport node. We can go and check the edge cluster as well. Inside edge transport node, we can go and see that how many edges we have in our lab. We have four. And for all those edges, you can go and check the configuration as well. Now the edges, we know that where you have the services related to DR or SR, you can go and run BGP, you can go and run any type of services like NAT and load balancing, etc. right? So for that, we have the uh, NSX customized uh, applications, you can think like that, is um, running on over the edge. So you can go install T0, T1, routers, etc. and the services as well, DR and SR. Great, so these edge devices can see that they they have transport zone both. Uh, we have two type of transport zone. We have overlay and we have VLAN backed segments on the network. And then it is connected with the uplink profile. It is connected with the uplink profile and then TEP address and the um, DP, DK fast path interfaces as well. I'll log in and I'll show you that how this uh, configuration look like. Uh, finally, uh, we can go and check the edge cluster at the moment in the lab section and find that there is one edge cluster having two members, ESXi 1 and 2, and the edge cluster profile is NSX default edge high availability profile. We'll go and add one more cluster here. In that cluster, we'll go and add two edges, S3 and 4. Okay, so it should show you 2 and 2. Let me quickly go to the lab section. Yeah. So here you can go to the system. And once you are in the systems, then you can go to the fabric and nodes. Right. Now inside node, uh, node, we have host transport nodes. So on top, you can see that we have host transport node. We can go and call this. Uh, vSphere, once you call that, you can see that uh, inside that we have actually two clusters are there. One is for compute, one is for edge, right? And uh, for this particular edge, so let's see that what is this actually. So this is compute, a reason A01 compute. And for this particular compute, uh, let's see that what TNP we have, transport node profile. And if I can scroll a little bit more. Okay, okay, from here. Let me make some space here. Uh, so you can see that it should have the attached TNP here. Uh, although if I scroll here, successfully created but you can't see. So I need to make some space in between here. Now you can see a little bit. 
and let me make some more space here. So you can see that comp 0 and TNP is applied. That's very much okay. Now we can go ahead and check the transport, edge transport nodes. And uh, inside this, we can see that we have four. I can see that uh, edge cluster is 0, 1 and edge cluster. Okay. So inside this four, you can see that these two uh, nodes, they are part of uh, edge cluster 0, 1. And next, what we'll do? that these two nodes are the edge nodes as well will make as a part of other ESXi. That's ESXi 0. This will create some other cluster and I'll move that. So if you want to check the configuration for any of the devices, click there. You can see that the ID configuration state uh, management IP and here the transport zones and the cluster logical router T0 gateway router is there, that's okay. We can go back and we can click edit here. I will verify a little bit more about this. And if you want to do any changes related to configuration, you can go and do that. So if I scroll down, you can see that the transpose zone and then you can see the IP pool. You can see the teaming uplink, policy uplink mapping and those policies, right? Great. So next task, what we want to do here, we want to go and check the edge first. So inside this edge cluster, you have the cluster profile as well, right? You can go and check the profile and you can check the edge cluster profile default. We are using this default profile. All right, let's go back to the nodes and we can go to the edge cluster inside this particular edge cluster, select and click edit. You can see the profile, and then you can see that you have two, two edge nodes selected, right? Because these two, we want to create one more. So add the edge cluster, I'll go and give the name, EDZE cluster, say zero two, and here you can see that his cluster profile is correct. Uh, we have actually only one. Then member edge nodes, if I scroll a little bit down, you can see that we can select this and then we can drag this inside the cluster. Click add. And they are successfully added. That's great. And you can see two and two, That that is good. Now, if you go back here to edge transport node, and if I go and click close here, so you can see now that 3A and 4A, they are part of the cluster. Okay, and I can see the tunnel endpoint IP is also assigned here. Uh, later on, we'll go and discuss more and more about these IP ranges and all. I mean, how the communication is happening behind the scene. All right, so we are very much done with this particular lab. Let's stop here. Welcome back everyone. In this module, NSX segments, what we are going to do, that will go and create the segment, logical switch segment. And that particular logical switch segment, so whatever segment will go and create, that will go and assign with one of the VM, and then we'll do the verification as well. So here you can see the steps that we can go to NSXT, we can, we can go to networking, we can go to segment and we can add segment. In my case, my segment name will be different, but here you can see that we can go and give the name, for example, LS new. I'm going to give the name as uh, DBLS, and then we can go and give the uplink type means it is going to connect with the tier zero gateway. Then we can go and give the overlay. We can go and add the subnet as well. So here you can see that add subnet to 172.160.1/24. I'm going to add 172.160.1/24, and then save it. 
Now, once we have segment created, we can see that summary of all different segments. So different, different segments are here. For example, LS, uh, app, DB, web, etc. We can we can check it. We can check that that those segment uh, segments connected where and the subnets as well. Yes, so we can check the summary, whatever we have created in these uh, steps. The next thing is this, that we can go to the vSphere client. We can go to that particular VM where we want to connect this segment. So once you go to that VM, you can go to edit setting, you can go to the networking and you can connect that particular segment with that VM. And we are mostly done with this. Then we can uh, check the summary for that particular VM. We can check what IP address this VM having. And then from our local system, uh, from where we are doing the lab, we can go and check the reachability as well, like ping test. We can check the reachability, right? Um, likewise, again, you can go back to NSXT and uh, whatever new segment that we have created, we can go and check it. We can go and edit it if it is required. And even we can go further on and check other segments as well, just for our knowledge perspective. Okay, so these are the steps I'm going to show you. So let's go to the NSXT dashboard. Now we are inside NSXT dashboard. You can go and click to the networking. And once you are in the network, you can see that we have option related to segments. I can go and click there to the segments. Once we are inside the segment, then we can go and click add segment. But before creating the uh, add segment, you can see that we have uh, different segments already there. We have web LS whose IP is 172.16.1. We have app LS whose IP is 172.16.20.1. In case if you want to see this in detail you can expand and you can see that uh, administrators connectivity multicast status uh, if you want you can go and click these three dots and if you want to see the edit means if you want to do any edit um, you can see here that it is connected with T0 gateway it's a overlay uh, overlay TZ that's a transport zone subnet IP CIDR, administrators, multicast routing is enabled. So some of the features here, they are default, correct? So in our case also, we want to go and create this segment and we can check as well, right? So let me go and close this. I want to go back and I wanted to create my own segment. So you need to scroll like this. You need to go like this since the page itself is a little bit small here. It's, you need to select where you're going. Let me click collapse all. Close editing. And we don't want to edit, right? So here you can see that uh, we can go now and we can add our segment, okay? So click add segment, give the name of the segment. So I will go and give DBLS, connected gateway, what gateway we want to connect. So tier zero gateway, that's okay. Then we need to select the transport zone and these things we have discussed earlier, right? So we have option here related to overlay transport, wheel and transport, etc. We can go and give that. Then we can scroll a little bit and then we'll give the IP 172.16.30.1 slash 24 is the IP address for us uh, plus the cider. Once we have that, then uh, uh, we don't have the DHCP here. I should go and save this setting, right? 
so here you can see that you have save button i can go click save button no problem but you can see that segment profile option is there ghcp static bindings are there let's click save now segment dbls is successfully created want to continue configuring this segment no it's okay we have created this segment now once you create this segment obviously nsxt has backup connection with the uh, vsphere so we can go to the vsphere client and we will go and log in to vsphere client we will go to that segment section that uh, segment section that we have inside the vsphere client and first of all we'll verify that segment got created and then we'll go and connect this segment with uh, dbvm so yeah here you can see that we have dbvm but in any case if you want to check the segment so then you can go and check the networking and inside network you can see that we have this dbls logical segment created and uh, that's okay the nsx manager and all uh, informations are there this transport is overlay tz segment is dbls at the moment we haven't connected this with the vm so we can go click there we can go to vms and templates from the home page or the menu and let's see that where is db so here we have db o one a you can click there and then you can right click you can go to edit settings and uh, network adapter what i want that i want to give this network adapter as a dbls okay and click okay so now uh, this is in action we can give few uh, seconds to this you can check the recent task as well you will see that it is in progress it will take maybe 30 seconds or one minute to get updated and i can see here that network adapter is dbls uh, that is very much done okay so again what we can do we can go back to nsxt and here also i can go and check that particular configuration so uh, we have created initially that logical segment right but uh, we haven't attached with the vm now we have attached with the vm so let me go to that segment and uh, segment here we where we have dbls oops in the bottom you have the refresh page so you can refresh this and uh, this dbls whose ip is this let's see that we have the segment profile in segment profile we have different type of uh, profiles like uh, ip discovery spoof card segment security mac related information the dscp we are not using uh, you can go and expand uh, advanced setting as well where you have evpn configuration right so you can check the topology as well now you can see here that uh, dbls is connected with one vm right and oops you can see that it now it is connected with dbo one a virtual machine right so now the status is connected we can see that inside the topology as well we can go click view stats not showing any bytes that is sended or received but if you go to that particular uh, it's try to ping to that particular ip 
1630.14. Let's see what's what's the IP it got. So it is getting the IP 30.11. Okay. So we can go and use 30.11. Oops, ping minus T. And uh, if we have any stats here, let's see. Showing some packet is transmitting. Multicast part and all. All right, so this is related to a stat. View related groups. DBLS is not part of any group. So that is very much it that you can go and add the segment and you can have a look over your configuration as well. Let me quickly go back to the slide. And uh, we have our slide here. Uh, so you can go and expand the ports and the segment port as well, right? So let's go back one more time here and I can go and exp expand to port and the segment port as well. So I can go click here and let's see that uh, where we have this port and segment port option. A port option is there. Oops. Let me scroll a little bit down. Down. Because this is in the same dashboard, you can see that uh, I have to uh, adjust my settings. Let me click here. I need to decrease the size so you can see that uh, that is showing somewhere. This is port, this port is showing zero. Should show some attached port, right? Hmm, no. So what I have done here, you can see I have refreshed this page a couple of times and then I can see that uh, port attach it is showing. Then you can click there to the port attach and now you can see that uh, we are receiving the communication with the uh, vSphere client, right? Then you can go and check other other things as well. Now, if I go back here, I just wanted to show you one more thing about this port. So let me check Web LS. And for Web LS, I just wanted to see. Oh, so here you can see two and uh, two VMs. You can see Web 01A and Web 02A. They are connected in this particular lab. So two VM, they are using this logical segment. In our case, we have only one VM, which is using this particular logical segment. And that's why the port is showing either one or two or three or four, etc. Okay, so this is the lab related to logical segment. We have done the testing as well, like ping test. Uh, we are very much good to stop here. Let's stop here. Welcome back everyone. Before starting the routing section and lab related to routing, I just wanted to explain a few of the tables that the LCP and CCP, they are holding and they are accommodating those tables, means they are sharing this information among each other. VTAP table, MAC table, and ARP table. Let's try to understand these tables. Now, this particular topic I am taking from one of the blogs that is vsteller.com. And I found this is very informative. That's why I am discussing uh, these tables from this particular blog. All right, you can go to this particular blog. You have some other nice articles blog as well that you can refer for your learning purpose. All right, so let's try to understand that how this VNI to uh, VTIP entry is getting created and then how it will be shared across the 
across the CCP and LCP or LCP and CCP. So what is happening here is this that uh, at the moment inside the transport zone will go and create the segment. So at the moment the segment will get created, you'll find that VNI, you know that v, VNI NT is, uh, is a network, uh, virtual network interface or virtual network seg segment, and it has a long list of integers. Like in VLAN, we have limitation that it has only uh, 4,000 virtual segments. But in case of uh, VNIs, we can have up to 65,000 segments, although we don't need that much. But it has that uh, flexibility that uh, number of uh, segments can increase. So at the moment, we have this uh, logical segment created. Same time, the VNI to tip entry will get created. Now this VNI to tip entry, what will happen with this VNI to tip entry is this, that uh, First of all, they will be stored inside the LCP, right? Now, once the LCP, the local control plane knows about a VNI to tip entry, then it will go and inform to the CCP over the management interface. So it will go and update the uh, information of VNI. And here you can see in the diagram. So it is going updating here this VNI to tip IP entry, all the host they are updating that entry to the central uh, centralized control plane. And once centralized control plane has this uh, this entry learned, then what it, it is doing. So it has all those information VNI to tip IP, and then it will go and periodically send that information to all the, all the host, right? To all the ESX, I can see now they have those information. So in future, if they have to do the communication, so VNI plus step entry, they will go form the tunnel and the endpoints, they will go and do the communication, right? So that's the uh, usability we have with the VNI to step entry. The next table we have MAC table. Now what is happening that over the host, over the ESXi, once you bring up the VM, a power on the VM, then that particular VM, obviously it has the MAC address, right? So that MAC address, and uh, since we have the logical segment as well, a uh, segment as well, so we have the VNI, we have the MAC address, we have the TIP IP, right? So all these entries, they are updated to LCP or getting updated to LCP, a same process will happen. LCP will send those information across to the CCP over the management interface. Once CCP has that information, periodically it will go and update that entry to all the host. So all the host knows what MAC address they have in different, different, uh, um, or same segment you can say, not different, different, but what MAC addresses they have, they can see across the logical segment right the last table we have is the arp table that's the mac to ip address table and the controllers they are learning this mac to ip address table so in future if there is any flood related to arp query or any flood or any arp broadcast storm is there so ccp will go and suppress that because ccp also having that information right so the same thing is happening that how the LCP will go and learn the IP to MAC or MAC to IP entry. It will go and give that information to CCP. And in future, if any broadcast will happen, then CCP will go and control such type of traffic. All right, so these are the tables we have. Knowing this much knowledge, we can go and continue our lab section related to now we are ready to start our module number four, NSX routing. Now this section will be a little bit lengthier than the other sections that we have, because in this section, uh, we are going to cover the lab part. You can see here the lab part related to uh, the, first of all, the overview of the uh, routing and then the routing in between east to west traffic, north to south traffic, high availability and ECMP. But even before starting that, I will go and explain you 
about the construct of routing, how the routing is actually happening uh, within the hypervisor, across the hypervisor, what are the key concepts we have related to DR, SR, and all the uh, routing parameters. So let's try to understand theory first. And obviously in upcoming section one by one, and I will cover the lab related to East, West, North, South, HA and ECMP. Okay, so first of all, when we are talking about routing, um, what does it mean? We know that if we have LAN segment, so suppose if I have LAN segment one, LAN segment two, so within the LAN segment, within the shared broadcast, you don't need routing, right? But when you want to cross from one subnet to other subnet, then you need some sort of a gateway because you are not able to find the destination within the same local subnet. So that broadcast packet will reach to the router gateway and then gateway will do or your router will do some sort of a route lookup and then he will try to find out where is the destination in the other segment. Likewise, the routing is happening, correct? Now, in this case, since everything is embedded, embedded means that you have your VMs over hypervisor, you have your uh, NSX services or NSX routers, DR, SRs, they are also over hypervisor. So how in the nesting environment or how in the embedded environment the routing is happening? Now, philosophy is the same. The technology is the same. Still, you have layer two segments. Still, you have logical segments. And you have the routers. You have to find the gateway uh, from the router. Router will do the route lookup. And then you have to reach to the destination. But we need to understand that where exactly all these components fit in. I have given one note here that please note that DR, distributed routing or routers, is not a VM. Actually, they are not the VM. They are uh, they are installed over hypervisor as a NSX services as a edge nodes. Okay, so DR on both hypervisor have the same IP address. I will show you this in the in the next diagram. And not only you can do the routing in between the VMs, but you can go and do the routing from VM to the physical component or physical world as well. So virtual to physical routing is also available. Now in this diagram, you can see that this is the logical diagram that you have multiple segments, say overlay segment or logical segment one and two, you have a web. Now these VMs, obviously they are hosted over hypervisor right? They are hosted over hypervisor or host or over host or hypervisor. Both are same, right? And then you are creating the construct, one of the construct or logical segment over transport zone. Remember, over transport zone, TZ, we have this logical segments, uh, you know, shared across the VM will see that we have actually distributed routing shared across the VM and they should have the same IP over different hypervisor or host. I will show you in the next uh, slide. But uh, the physical diagram, you can see that you have uh, VMs. You can see that you have the VMs over the hypervisors. You have the VMs over the hypervisor. And then we have different... Uh, hypervisors or host where we have control plane, data plane, management plane, and the communication in, with, in between the NSXT world and the vSphere client. So vSphere client is also hosted there or kind of uh, uh, software uh, from where you can manage the entire infrastructure related to VMs and all those components, all those uh, logical switches and components actually they are initiated over the hypervisors managed from NSX and the VSR client that we have seen in the previous sections as well. So like it's a embedded type of environment, you have to first of all understand these components, where they are situated, and then you have to go and understand the traffic flow in between that. Okay, so let's try to understand that if we are talking about single tier router, single tier router means that you have only one gateway. So you have only one gateway. And if I have diagram, you can think this as a T0. 
your gateway router or TS0 router, and then all the segments are connected with that only one gateway. This is actually two tier architecture where you have T0 router connected with T1, and then T1 is connected with the, with the other logical segments. Why I have taken this diagram? I just wanted to show you the link. So in between T0 and T1, we have a router link port. So on this interface also, this interface also, you have router link port. Then you are connected with different type of logical segments. And these interfaces that you, you are seeing that going to the down link, uh, for those link, this router is the gateway, correct? And then you can go and connect the physical world from T0 where you can go and do the peering with the BGP, et cetera. Okay, again, in the upcoming section, you will understand more and more about that. Now, if you go, and initiate some sort of services like NAT, uh, any type of uh, firewalling services, security services, etc. Then you have to go and initiate the service routing component as well. So two components are there. If you're doing uh, just routing, that's you have distributed uh, routing component or DR. If you are doing services as well, you have to initiate the SR as well. Great. So let's try to understand about DR first. And in the next recording, we'll understand the SR. So DR is essentially a router having logical interfaces called LIFs, logical interface, A, B, C, D, suppose connected. Um, you have connected downlinks with different, different logical segments. Now it runs on a kernel module and is distributed in hypervisor across all transport node, including edge node. The traditional data plane functionality of routing, so it can do route lookup, it can do ARP lookup, is performed by the logical interfaces. Each logical interface has a virtual MAC and the IP address represented by the default gateway for the L2 segment, so nothing new. It will do the ARP lookup, routing lookup, it has the MAC address, it has the constant IP address. The IP address is unique per uh, logical interface and remains the same anywhere in the logical uh, slash logical or segment switch exist. So what does it mean that you have Mac address constant throughout the segment and then you have logical address or IP address constant throughout the uh, hypervising services. So let me show you this. So these, uh, these things, what new thing uh, here is this that the DR is and they are running over the kernel module uh, and is distributed in the hypervisor across all the transport node. That's the key thing. Uh, rest of the parameters, you can see here, the rest of the parameters that you have, they are almost same that we are doing in the traditional routing as well, right? So no new thing here. Now let's try to understand with the diagram. So here in this diagram, you can see that if you are talking about same hypervisor, workload on the same hypervisor about east to west traffic, if you are doing the communication. So the logical diagram, you can see that how this, this will look like here and here, and the actual physical diagram will look like this. So you have web tier, you have app tier. For web, you have 10.0 IP. For app, you have 20.0 IP. And you can see that how they are connected, okay, how they are connected. The only thing I want to show you here is the IP address. So across the hypervisors, you can see the gateway IP address is the same. And now if you do the packet walk, so suppose within the same hypervisor, if I do the communication, so it will uh, it will go and do the query to the, so VM, uh, web one will go and do the query or ARP lookup or the route lookup to the DR with the local hypervisor or hypervisor with the local DR, right? And then he will get the response. So what hypervisor one DR will do, it will do reverse ARP. It will flood that ARP request, okay? And once it get the response related to in this segment, what is the uh, local MAC? In this segment, what is the IP address? And according to that, you will get the response. The same thing I have uh, explained here. So it will go do the 
route lookup at the DR. If DR knows the destination, it will give the destination. Otherwise, it will do the R flooding and it will give you the uh, MAC address of the destination and the routing will happen. And same thing will happen in the reverse direction as well. But this is the case related to when you are on the same machine. And I have given all the steps here. You can pause the recording and you can read through as well. So once the MAC address of app one is learned, the L2 lookup is performed in the local MAC table to determine how to reach app one and the packet send. Same thing that I told you. But interesting thing here is this, that if you are doing the communication across the hypervisor, so across the hypervisor also you have same IP, right? But first of all, web one try to request, means it will try to reach to DR1 and DR1 will see that, oh, this is not locally in my segment, but this is there in the other DR segment. So he will forward that query to other DR with the same IP, right? And then the um, request will be fulfilled, means it will reach to the destination. So the routing decision taken by DR on hypervisor one and the DR on hypervisor two. So who will take the routing decision? These DR will take the routing decision across different hypervisor as a, a VM kernel services. And then the web one send the traffic to web two. The routing is done on DR HV1. And then the reverse flow of the traffic will happen. Okay, so we have discussed a lot in this particular section, first of all, what are the components we have for routing? We have DR and SR, what is tier zero and tier, uh, single tier and multiple or multi-tier architecture, right? And then how the traffic is flowing within the same hypervisor and across the hypervisor. So we are very much good here. Let's stop here. Before understanding the services router, why not let's complete one lab so whatever we have discussed in our previous section, that how the routing is happening and all those setup about T0 and T1, let's perform a lab task and then we'll go and understand the uh, service router concepts and remaining part. So let's go to the NSX dashboard. We are inside the NSX dashboard. Here you can see we can go to the networking and once we are inside the networking, first of all, I want to show you about this segment. So once you are inside the segment, you can see all these segments, uh, app, DB, and web. At the moment, they are connected with T0 gateway. That means at the moment, we have single tier architecture. So now what I want to do, I want to create T1 gateway. So let's add tier one gateway. And let me give the name, say its name is T1 Gateway 01. And this is linked with T0. So now we have two tier architecture. We can go and save this. Now, one thing we know at this point of time that initially when we are working in our lab topology, before saving this item. So let me try to draw here. So what was the idea? So idea was this, that everything was connected with T0, means all the logical segments. So we have web, app, and tier. Everything is connected with T0. Now what I ha we have done, we have connected T0 with T1, right? And now he is linked with T0. Now, instead of these links that we have with T0 directly, now we have to go and connect all the logical segments. So whatever web, app, and DB segments we have, we'll go and connect with the T1, first thing. Second thing is this, that these are the connected interfaces to T1, right? So these connected interfaces also we need to advertise. So two things we need to do now that we have to go and connect those segments to T1 and then we have to advertise the network as well. So here you can see that we have this route advertisement option and inside route advertisement option, you can go and enable one of the option 
you can see there are multiple options related to NAT, load balances, a static route, DNS forwarder. But what I want to do here that all connected segment and service port. This we have to enable, click save here. Okay, now again, we'll go back to the segments. Editing is process, no. So it's still, let me close this editing. Uh, now we can see the success. So now we can go to the segments and then we can edit all these segments connecting to T0, tier zero, we'll go and connect to tier one. So let's do this, connect to tier one, save this, right? Then for DB as well, let me, let me close this editing as well, minimize this. Then we'll go to DB and for DB also, DB logical segment also click edit and connect this with the tier one. Save this setting as well. This is saving the setting. Then minimize this from here. Then you can go to the web as well. And inside web also you can click edit. Change the gateway. So here also you have gateway as tier one save this and then you can go and close the editing so now you can understand that we have advertising the routing this connected routings and these gateways these logical segments they are connected with tier one gateway now we can go and do the testing so i can go to the vsphere client where we have uh, vms so let's go and log into the VM. So what I will do from web, I will try to reach to the app and DB VM. So it's loading and once we'll get the IP address for all those VM. So you can see that the app VM having IP 20.11, what's about DB and DB it has IP 30.11. So what I want to do, let me go and start this web 01A and launch the web console. Let me log in there. And let me try to give the password, try to log in. I need to check the password. Oh, now we are logged in. So if we check the IP here, you can see IP is 172, 172 20.11 for a web. And you can see it is reachable. Then maybe 30 or 40, 30.11 for DB and you can see it is reachable. So you, you have seen that how easily we have done this lab. This was related to east to west traffic. We are able to reach from east to west, uh, from web to app and DB and vice versa with simple manipulation in the lab area. All right, let's just stop here. So what we have done so far, we have covered the theory, basic theory uh, related to NSXT. And then we have performed the lab task as well. At the moment, we are very much comfortable knowing different terminologies inside NSXT. Now the next topic we have is that logical routing of uh, north to south traffic. And for this particular topic, not only that you should understand DR, uh, distributed routing, but you have to understand about services router as well. Now, previously I told you that I'm going to start services router uh, after that particular video, 
But even starting that services router, and that's the video number 22, before even coming to video number 22, I just wanted you that you follow the sequence of videos. And after this video, go complete your video number 18, 19. Try to understand about Geneva encapsulation. Check that, uh, uh, check the theory related to when we are talking about north to south or south to north traffic then the role of this SR. Anyways, I'm going to cover more SR in video number 22. And also you should know the packet flow, how the packet is flowing within the endpoints or within the VMs. Okay. Once you complete up to that, again, uh, continuing this, these videos, go and complete two-tier routing architecture of NSX as well. And then, so after one, two, three, four, five, six videos, we're going to do the lab related to north to south or south to north traffic. Okay, so please go complete six videos after this particular video, and then we will move to the lab section. We are continuing the logical switching, and we'll see that inside NSXP, what major feature and how the NSXP is doing the logical switching. And it's one of the very important feature of NSXT that why customer will choose NSXT over other uh, vendors or over other product. Uh, if we have same type of product who is doing the virtualization for the data center, why NSX has advantage and it's a huge advantage over any other product. So let's see that how we are, uh, it is doing the uh, logical switching. Now, if you see any of the data center, you'll find that now we have the clause fabric that means we have leaf spine structure so you have so for example a spine one and a spine two and these are spine one and a spine two suppose you have leaf one leaf two and leaf three for example so you have leaf to a spine connectivity uh, so you can see let me draw one more time so suppose i have a spine one a spine two suppose i have leaf one and leaf two so leaf will go and connect with the spine leaf we go go and connect uh, with the spine. There is no connectivity with, between leaf to leaf and a spine to a spine. This is something like class architecture. So whenever they will form any dynamic tunnel, those tunnel are very much direct tunnel. Okay, so you can refer any ACI uh, design document or even you can refer my ACI course where I have explained this class architecture. Okay, now here in our NXXT realm, uh, in NSXT world, what is happening? You find that mostly everything is virtual or even if it if it is a physical, it is represented as a virtual world. So for example, here you can see that uh, I have hypervisor. Hypervisors, they are representing the tunnel endpoint. So you have hypervisor, AKA, for example, you have tip tunnel endpoint. So I have hypervisor one, hypervisor two, hypervisor three, like that you can see in the other rake. So suppose I have rake one. This is again just the uh, physical representation of the virtual uh, solution, something like that. So rake one, rake two, rake three, and over the rake you have hypervisors, over the hypervisors you have virtual machine. Now suppose a virtual machine of hypervisor one, that's the VM one, wants to communicate with the virtual machine that is VM5 of hypervisor 5. So how they will communicate? Obviously in class architecture, they will send their request or the request will go via the control plane. This control plane will direct that, okay, you have to create dynamic tunnel between leaf to leaf or for example, the end point to end point. So uh, in between tip one, tip five, we are creating the uh, dynamic tunnel to do the communication, but in VMware, everything will be connected with the segment or they are inside the same transport. So you can see that the logical representation is simply that VM1 wants to communicate over VM5 with one switch in between. That's it. That's how the VMware Nexus T has uh, simplify the data center traffic uh, a pattern or uh, traffic flow 
to be more precise. All right, just the explanation you have uh, that we have seen and in that diagram it is not showing that what's the controller but yeah in case of uh, uh, single transport obviously the frame so suppose vm1 of hypervisor 1 wants to communicate with vm5 of hypervisor 5 that frame will be flooded and we'll see that what methods we have but this is the simplicity we have that they can go and communicate now i have one note here this note is telling the benefit of NSXT overlay model is that it allowed direct connectivity between the transport node irrespective of a specific underlay inter rake connectivity L2 or L3 segments. Uh, L2 or L3 segments can also be created dynamically without any configuration of physical infrastructure. So they will build create the dynamic tunnel to do the communication from one VM hosted over or installed over one hypervisor to other VM uh, on other hypervisor. Now you can see that what is happening in case of flooded traffic, how they can do the communication. Now that's uh, one of the, we can say the drawback of uh, NSXT that they are not understand or they are unable to do the distinction between in between the bump traffic like broadcast, unknown, unicast, multicast. So all the traffic they are taking as the same type of traffic and they are flooding it. Okay, so to do this, to react with this flooded traffic, we have actually two method for flooding traffic. What are those method? Those method are head end replication mode, two tier hierarchical mode. So let's see one by one. What does it mean by head end replication mode? What is happening in case of head end replication mode that simply the frame is flooded throughout the transport node, throughout the transport. And whoever get that flood packet, if that is the destination, he will respond back. Now the problem with this that uh, you are sending the packet over all the available links let me show you the diagram. I have the diagram. So here you can see the in the diagram that suppose the same situation VM1 of hypervisor 1 wants to communicate with VM5 of hypervisor 5. Then what is happening that the frame from the VM1 you can send uh, you can see here that it is going to the spine 1 the spine 2. So you have multiple spines or so whatever spines we have suppose here I have two spine spine 1 and spine 2. So here you can see that uh, it is going to all the hypervisors. So one, two, three, four, five, and then you can see here uh, six and seven. So same packet you are sending seven replication or same frame has the seven uh, replicas that is going to watch all the uh, rakes all the hypervisor all the VMs in this case. This is not part of transport zone So that's why we don't have uh, any uh, Diagram here attaching this this is not part of transport So the part of transport you can see the green arrows it is showing here So what is happening is that we are unnecessarily over utilizing the bandwidth capability or bandwidth and that's not the better design So we have the better design that is a two tier hierarchical mode in 2 tier hierarchical mode, what is happening that all the rakes, so suppose I have rake 1, 2, 3, and those rakes I can give different set of tip addresses. Uh, so what will happen with that? Let's discuss that. So here you can see that in 2 tier hierarchical mode, transport nodes are grouped according to the subnet of the IP address of their tip. So we have the grouping of the transport nodes. Transport node in the same rake typically share the same subnet. It's not mandatory, just is the way uh, to react to the flooded traffic in the two tier hierarchical mode. So let's see the diagram here. You can see the diagram. What is happening in this case that you have 10, 20, 30. Uh, here it is showing public IP, but it can be any private address. Just for the simplicity, we have 10, 20, 30. Uh, it should be private IP only within, within the premises. So I have three different subnet 10, 20, 30. What is happening? The same situation, B, uh, VM1 of hypervisor, he wants to communicate with the VM5 of hypervisor. Then in the last case, remember, we have sent all the replicas of the uh, frame, but here what is happening, and it's very interesting, and 
uh, two tier hierarchical mode is that uh, so for example you are here you are sending one copy two copy that's the local so within local rig you are doing flood i am flooding inside my local rig but to the other rig what is happening you are sending only one copy and here the system can take decision either that copy can go to the uh, hypervisor 4 or it can go to the hypervisor 5 hypervisor 6 is not in the transport zone so either it can go to 4 or 5 either one either it go to 4 or it go to 5 what is happening here that so for example once 4 got this packet then he will send the replicated packet to all the other hypervisors okay let me try one more time so for example you are sending that one frame packet either you can say send a system will choose you can send that frame to hypervisor 7 8 or 9 suppose you have sent that frame to this tunnel destination tep 7 destination uh, to hypervisor 7 now this hypervisor 7 will send the replica to other hypervisors and whoever is the destination who will respond so in this way you can see that you are using only two dynamic tunnel rather you are ten, uh, using say for example five or six dynamic tunnel and that's a huge savior of the bandwidth so for the flooded type of traffic uh, we should use this methodology and nsxt is recommending this particular methodology to use because this is the optimal way uh, to use or to handle the flooded traffic all right so let's stop here next we have overlay encapsulation that is uh, geneve in nsxt nsxt uses geneve uh, like in aci we have vxlan or ivxlan uh, like that we have geneve and Gene, geneve is actually quite a bit extensive uh, you can say that protocol uh, which is which is providing enhanced flexibility in terms of data plane ex extensibility here you can see the format and uh, i have given a link as well so you can go and refer this uh, link where you will get the draft about this genif that nsxt is using so it is providing extra flexibility extensibility inside the uh, say for example with respect to vxlan inside the data plane and with Geneve actually what's the one of the most uh, advantageous thing we have with Geneve is that they have something called TLB uh, type length value and with uh, help of TLB uh, this will allow any vendor to add its own metadata in the tunnel header and that's quite interesting we have one small example related to this i'll show you that example that how geneve with type length value helping to learn other tep metadata when he is sending the flood packet to the other hypervisor we'll see that so what are the features it has identify the tep that source a tunnel packet so identification of tip there is a version bit inside that just to identify uh, what a stage of uh, upgrade is this there is one bit uh, with uh, which is indicating where the encapsulated frame is to be traced now the point number fourth here that we have an example so we'll see that in two tier hierarchy uh, hierarchical flooding mechanism they come to know or they store the metadata so when the packet or when the frame is going to the destination hypervisor they should understand that which particular mac this tep belongs to i'll show you this example in the next slide and this uh, geneve they have two bits identify the type of the source tep tunnel endpoint so what i try to explain here is that say for example in two tier architecture so recall this diagram we have discussed about this so here you can see that you have different different subnets you have different transport and to optimize the data plane what we are doing from one hypervisor so suppose vm1 wants to communicate with vm4 so he will send only one packet to any random hypervisor in this group now what will happen so for example 
this particular guy is also interested to take the flooded packet. So suppose I have sent this packet here or the frame here to hypervisor six. Now what will happen now? It's the responsibility of hypervisor six is to replicate is to send the replicated packets to other hypervisor and whoever hypervisor having the VM4 they will respond and then they will start communicating or the communication right so same way I have an example you'll see that instead of six uh, it is going to five and then five is sending the replicated packet to TEP4 so let's see the example first so here you can see that web one this is the web VM over hypervisor one wants to communicate say for example web 04 of hypervisor 4 but what is happening that he is sending the packet or the frame to the hypervisor 5 and he is sending the replicated frames to all the hypervisor in that group in that case when hypervisor 4 is getting that frame he is thinking oh mac address 1 actually it belongs to tep5 and that's the confusion he has because Mac one belongs to hypervisor one TEP one correct so in that case learning of the metadata is very important so when we are using the Geneve encapsulation in in that case you can see that in the tunnel header they have the metadata so now when the frame arrives to hypervisor 4 he look that table and he find oh Mac one actually its parent is TEP one. It belongs to TEP one and that's why the data plane learning has been optimized in this case. All right, so we can stop here now. In this session, let us discuss about north to south routing by service router hosted on edge node. So we are going to see the direction and what is happening, what type of encapsulation, decapsulation and how the packet is flowing from north to south and then south to north. Here you can see the physical topology. If you want to communicate that your request from the VM, go to the local switch. From local switch, it will go to the DR. From DR, it will go to the edge. Edge where you have the SR and then it will go to the outside. That will be the flow. Here you can see that your DR is uh, a kernel module over compute hypervisor and your edge is there in the infrastructure cluster in the management controller and in that particular cluster even uh, we'll see that in the lab section I'll show you that uh, topology one more time that where we have the VMs and the DR and where we have the SR and DR in the edge so this is the topology uh, let me go and show you uh, the flow of traffic in this particular topology so here you can see that the web so here is the web having ip 172.160.11 and mac virtual mac or the mac address is mac1 he wants to communicate with outside he wants to go outside so what will happen how the traffic will flow uh, we'll see each and everything so first of all it will go and connect to its gateway Gateway is this particular uh, DR and it's the local router it has, a local gateway. Now what will happen in the destination IP, he, he can see that, oh, this IP is belonging to 192, 168, 100 something. So 192, 168, 100 or something. That is not there in my local subnet or that is not there in my uh, route lookup I'm not able to find it then he will go and contact the SR now once he will go and reach the SR here you can see that in between so we have two type of TEP here we have ESXi tap address and then here you have the uh, edge each uh, edge tap that's the change we have that we have discussed in uh, in our previous sections in the initial uh, sessions that now the edge devices they can do encapsulation decapsulation and that's the change we have in 2.3 versus 2.4 so edge devices now they have the intelligency that they can do the encapsulation and decapsulation so what is happening here that the actual source and destination IP so whatever payload was there that will be 
encapsulated inside the TEP with the help of Geneve uh, encapsulation. So this source destination, so this TEP address will go and reach here. So you have done the encapsulation means ESXi TEP has tip has done the encapsulation and then H tip will do the decapsulation. Once you open the packet, you'll see oh the destination IP is belonging to for example 192.168 something. Now to reach to that IP now this responsibility of the SR that SR we know that SR can run a static route or VGP route. So SR can determine oh this IP I can reach via 192.168.240.1 that's the gateway to reach to 192.168.100.0. Now here you have the detailed explanation of whatever we have seen. So web wants to communicate with this IP. It will contact to the gateway That's step number one. Now the DR don't have the route to reach to that. So he will go and contact to the SR. Then we have the Geneve encapsulation in between that actual payload will be forwarded over this source IP, the source of TEP and destination of TEP, tap address. Now what will happen that the edge node will decapsulate the packet and then it will send to the SR. This thing also we have discussed. Now the SR perform a routing lookup and determine the route this belonging to this gateway. Now the packet is sent on the VLAN segment to the physical router and finally delivered to this IP. So these are the steps you can pause the recording and you can make a note in your notebook. So you can draw this particular diagram and then you can make all the steps that you can see here. Now what about the return traffic when the traffic is coming from here and it is tying to web one that IP is this. So in that case you can see the flow of the packet. First of all the packet will go and hit the SR. So SR because uh, SR is the uh, link that is exported to the external device. So now what will happen the that the local lookup will happen single lookup actually will happen at the SR or DR label at this point. Now when they see this particular lookup they see oh this destination IP address and this destination IP address is belonging to TEP because remember they are learning the means these devices they are learning the TEP to MAC or the virtual MAC IP from the central controller. So either that will be there in the local control or they will learn the TEP to the MAC uh, resolution or MAC table from the control plane. So now the SR will think oh, or will he will be confirmed that this particular IP is belonging to which particular TEP. Then uh, the Geneve they will do the encapsulation. So now the edge device edge will do the encapsulation. So source will be his TEP address destination will be the ESXi tap address and the pocket a packet will be forwarded to, to this DR. Now when the packet will come to this DR then what will happen this DR will not do the lookup because the lookup has already done near to the source. So here you can see all these important things that lookup is happening near to the source all which so near the source and there are so many things that we can go and write it in paper. So lookup is happening near to the source. These SR devices having services and the DR are doing ARP and the routing lookup and the TEP. Now the edge devices can do the uh, TEP encapsulation, decapsulation. The DR, SR, they can be host. They are hosted over edge and this DR is a kernel module over ESXi. So these are the important and high points we have that is very different in other STN solution. So now already lookup has happened. Now he will see that okay which particular segment had this particular MAC address this particular IP address and then he will forward the packet and in this way the destination to source packet flow will happen. So now whatever I explained you the same thing is written here uh, again you can if you want you can pause the recording and um, make a note and you can go all the six steps. So this is a way that with help of SR the lookup is happening and source to destination and destination to source packet flow is happening.
Hi there. Thanks for your enrollment. We are in one minute ad break. In this break, I'm going to show you that I have so many courses uploaded over Udemy. And if you're going to enroll my courses, you will get 95% discount. Every month, three times. First week, mid of the month, and the last week of the month. I am sharing the coupons. If you go and use those coupons, then my courses related to CCNP, related to CCI, all those courses, you are going to get heavy discount up to 95%. You can see the prices are a little bit higher here, but if you go and apply the coupon, the prices will go rock bottom. So go use those coupons. Suppose if you don't have those coupons, then you can always ping me over YouTube, you can send me email, you can ask for those coupons, I will provide you that coupon. So get the coupon, get the discount. Some of my courses over Udemy, they are bestseller. Some of the courses are quite new like SD-WAN automation, DNA automation, a CCI data center 3.0. Those are the new uploads as well. So please go continue your learning, take the coupon, enroll my courses and study well. All the best. This section onward, we are going to discuss about NSXT routing, how NSXT is performing the routing, and we'll see that we have the distributed router and the uh, service routers, so we'll see that. All right, so let's begin. Now I want to highlight here a few of the very important points that may be confusing as well. So first of, first of all, we'll see here that the DR, the distributed router, is not a VM. And DR on both hypervisors have the same IP address. So when we are talking about the routing or the routing process, it's the same routing process that we learn in Cisco or Juniper or any routing vendors, correct? So same thing is happening means uh, you have multiple, say for example, LAN segments and if you, if you have suppose different type of LAN segments, means one of the LAN uh, is having subnet 20, other LAN having subnet 30, then because these are in these particular LAN are in different subnets, then they need to do routing lookup. Means whatever VM you have here, if they want to communicate to the VM in the other network, other subnet, then the routing lookup will happen. So routing process will happen and the router will do the ARP uh, lookup as well. So those things will happen. So whatever routers are doing, all those functions will be happen. The thing we need to uh, remember here or note here is that it's not a VM and we'll see that different type of variation in, inside this, but this is not the VM. The second important thing here in the note, you can see that in modern data center, we have 70% of workload or 70% of load towards east to west traffic. So we have two type of traffic. One is going from east to west, where you can see that you have 70% of workload. And other one is obviously north to south. So remaining will be, uh, remaining load will be over north to south, correct? So now knowing these things, let's go and check. We have few diagrams as well to understand this. Now, if you see here the logical representation, so you have the logical topology and the physical topology. Logical topology is same like you have Cisco, for example, CSR, and then you have multiple 2950 or maybe three key switches connected. So in that case, if different, because what is happening, all the interfaces of routers, they are in different subnet. So one subnet wants to communicate with other subnet, the routing lookup will happen, correct? Now here you can see the physical uh, topology how it look like so we have the leaf and the spine structure uh, at this point of time we know that okay we have the VMs that is hosted over hypervisors so we have multiple VMs now here you can see that this DR is nothing but the kernel module installed over hypervisor so here you can see the difference that either this particular DR is a kernel module over hypervisor. So this DR is a kernel module over hypervisor or this DR 
and we'll see that uh, the dr and ds or maybe s are so dr and sr that's the exact term distributed routing or distributed router service routers they are installed over edge and what's the use of edge what's the difference between we'll see that we have uh, slides for that so dr and sr uh, why they are different wh what's the difference all those things we'll we'll see but here also if you see the diagram when you want to go to the van at that time obviously you want to do some sort of NAT some sort of load balancing some sort of filtering so that's why you need some services so in that case SR will come and it will be in use so basically for north to south or south to north traffic you are using SR over edge and if you need a route lookup on the same edge at that time you can do DR so whenever you are doing routing related things you have the DR either over edge or over the uh, say for example hypervisor now when you are uh, doing the traffic movement from east to west so at that time your uh, routers will come into the picture all right so let's quickly go and check few of the features that we have with uh, the DR before that here clearly you can see that uh, in the single tier routing so we have actually two different type of tier of routing so we have so for example single tier routing and then we have tier 0 and tier 2 that is nothing but double tier so two tier architecture also we have and that's the recommended so VMware is recommending that you use two tier architecture routing process and in our lab section we are going to use two tier routing process but yeah there is no limitation you can have your DRSR in single tier also in second tier or two tier also and we'll see that that either it's a single tier or two tier architecture in both the case we can have distributed routing we can have service routing so both the components we can have and both the components having different type of roles so let's see first of all the distributed routers what is their role and use so here you can see that DR is essentially a router with logical interface. So they have actually logical virtual interface. So you have a router with logical interface. So for example, LIF1, LIF2, LIF, LIF3. So three subnets representing three logical interfaces. They are nothing but the kernel modules installed over the hypervisor across all the transport, including the edge nodes. So they can be expanded from hypervisor till the edge node uh, you can refer the diagram that we have discussed then the traditional data plane uh, functionality of routing and so what they will do they will do aka routing and ARP lookups like the use of routers so whatever routers functionality is there DR will do that same each leaf have virtual make MAC address and IP address representing the default gateway uh, to its logical segment. So we know that that router generally they are connected with switch Now in this switch you have we have NVDS actually. So you have NVDS This switch whenever they wants to reach their gateway obviously they will contact the uh, This interface that the gateway interface or this router will work as a gateway for L2 segment Then this is very important this fifth point the IP address is unique per leaf and remains the same anywhere in the uh, segment logic where is the switch exist the virtual Mac associated with each leaf remains constant in each hypervisor allowing the default gateway and Mac remain the same during the V motion. So what it is telling let me show you in the diagram if you see this diagram you'll find that this DR is distributed uh, across so for example host 1 and host 2 now here you can see in host 1 and host 2 host 2 they have the leaf so leaf 1 leaf 2 uh, leaf 3 for example but this will be the leaf 1 and leaf 2 in other hypervisor so here clearly you can see the gateway address over all the hypervisors are same and the virtual mac will be the same so it will look like this this is the logical representation but physically the diagram is like this now here 
we can go and verify that how the packet is moving so suppose in the same hypervisor hypervisor 1 web wants to communicate with app so what will happen at that time because they are in the different subnet one is in subnet 10 other is in 20 so obviously they will go and do the arp lookup they will go and check where is my default gateway because this ip the destination ip is not in my local subnet so he, he will go and do the query to the router hey router please give me this particular ip then what router will do they will do the arp look, lookup and here is the interesting thing i'll show you in the next uh, slide that i have all the points but what will happen suppose this router will try to do the arp lookup so he will try to find out the ip associated mac or virtual mac now suppose he is not able to find it then he will send that query to the control plane remember initially when we have a study about these things i told you that you have local control plane and you have global control plane or centralized control plane ccp so ccp control plane and local control plane correct so then this router dr will go and query to the controller if controller having that resolve thing he will inform oh this is you are looking for otherwise controller will do the flood and try to do a reverse proxy try to get ip mac and then it will give this dr okay meanwhile in this case you can see the route lookup is happening locally to the hypervisor and then they will go and communicate so let me quickly show you the slide where we have all these things so suppose 10.11 wants to communicate with 20.11 it will go and contact to the router at the gateway interface now dr performs the routing lookup for this particular ip because it is connected with other interface a lookup is performed at other interface lift to arp table to determine the mac address associated with the ip if arp entry does not exist the controller is queried the local controller will, controller will ask to the central controller if there is no response from the controller the arp request is flooded okay so you are querying to the gateway arp is happening routing lookup is happening then once the mac address of app one is learned the l2 lookup is performed in the local mac table to determine how to reach app one and the packet is sent the return packet means for the return packet from app follows the same process and routing would happen locally to the dr that's the key local routing is happening and that's why we are reducing the load over the routing work workload so overall routing workload will be reduced now suppose if you have to do the communication so for example this ip wants to communicate with this ip but they are in the different hypervisor so at that time two route lookup will happen route lookup will happen at dr so he will try to contact his local dr then the packet will forward it so source to destination this router dr1 so for example this is dr1 but logically they are dr only so dr1 will do the route lookup but for the destination to source this router will do the lookup and that's the only difference we have rest all the things will be the same that whatever we have studied so now clearly you can see that how the routing has been simplified here in the process and that's the use of dr so let's stop here and next section we'll study about let us understand service router now we have a study about the dr that is the distributed router and we come to know that distributed router is not a vm but it's a kernel module installed over hypervisor but what is happening that if you have different type of traffic requirement that means like some services that NXXT are not distributed, which type of services? Due to locality or a stateful nature. So you want some, some type of services like physical infra connectivity, NAT, DHCP server, load balancing, VPN, gateway firewall, bridging, service interfaces, metadata proxy for OpenStack. So these are the services, these are separated from the routing capabilities so for that you need extra set of program for that you need extra set of module 
and that's the reason we have something called edge node now what is happening this edge node so the appliance where the centralized services or sr instances are hosted are called edge node so those edge nodes they don't have only the sr but they can have uh, dr as well so let me show you the diagram let me go to the next slide so here you can see in the diagram that clearly uh, when you see this particular say for example uh, your edge node so edge node having sr capability and dr capability both the capabilities they have this is the log logical diagram where you have the segments connected to sr and dr but if you go and check the physical topology it will be very much clear so i have my hypervisor where i have the distributed router and we have a study in the previous section that how the packet flow it will help basically in nsxt it is recommended that they are doing the routing lookup near to the source and that's the key routing lookup near to the source now if you see here the edge node edge node having the dr edge node having the sr as well now if we focus on sr you can see the sr having connectivity that is the external connectivity means sr is there who can do the north to south routing lookups now here you can see that sr is connected with uh, various logical switches as well and one is special connectivity in orange color you can see that is the transit segment connectivity that is nothing but the intra tier transit link so that means that uh, this sr having various type of interfaces and connectivity here those interfaces are listed so they have the external interface which is supporting a static routing and bgp to learn or advertise the network they have a service interface that will go and connect with the vlan segment then they have the intra tier transit link what is what this uh, is doing is that the connectivity between the dr and sr so that means that dr and sr they are doing some interconnectivity and clearly you can see here that a transit overlay segment is auto plumbed between dr and sr and each gets ip in the range of 1692540.0/25 subnet by default this address range is configurable and can be changed if this particular subnet is used somewhere else in the network and then finally they have the linked segment that link segment uh, interfaces that has co connected with the overlay segment all right so now uh, we can draw some conclusion here that sr is there th that is hosted over the edge node sr is there for these particular services these list of services and sr having these four interfaces now we can uh, stop here and in the next section uh, we'll see that with help of sr how the packet is flowing from sr to the external network and external network to the sr so far we have discussed about tier 1 routing in this section we are going to discuss about two tier architecture now this is actually recommended from vmware that you use two tier architecture why because this will be easier for the uh, providers to simplify the routing and other services while it will be easier for the tenant managers or management who is managers or the administrator who are managing the tenants to manage different type of tenants to manage the tier 1 correct so let me quickly show you the diagram why I, what i tried to explain here and by the way this is not a mandatory design but this is recommended from vmware here you can see that you have tier 0 gateway and then uh, you can manage easily the routings external routings and the services and then you have the tier 1 gateway that can manage the tenants all right so let's quickly see that what are the capabilities we have with the tier 0 and tier 1 gateway here you can see the tier 0 gateway they have connected uh, interfaces now say for example you have tier 0 gateway it can be connected with the external world it can be connected with the overlay it can be connected with t1 correct so here you can see that uh, it has the overlay 
that's the connected segment it can be connected with the service interface it can be connected with the outside okay now it can do the static route it can do the bgp uh, it can do the nat ip uh, it has the ipsec local ip uh, it can be configured dns forwarding ip it can configure so these are the services routing plus services we have in tier 0 now in this diagram it will be very much clear so let's start with tier 1 here you can see that tier 1 has this service interface who's having ip of it is connected with the vlan seg segment who's having ip of 192.168.10.0 then it has the overlay segment having ip 172.160.10.0 so what is happening here that the tier one having two connected interfaces uh, where they have the services and the overlay so here you can see that t1c t1 connected these two ip addresses they are getting advertised to tier zero now here you can see the, in the red one default route with the next hop ip as 164.224 in between this link is auto installed on tier one as soon as connected with tier zero so how tier zero is seeing tier one route is via the gateway now let's see this particular notes that 172 and 192 are seen as tier one connected so t1c the tier zero can see the, all these t1c routes apart from that he has his own routes so what is own routes 172.1620 and 192.168.240 that's the external route so now he can see the t1c route now he can see the t0c routes t1 connected t0 connected routes now in the third item here you can see now the t0 gateway redistribute t0 connected and t1 connected routes inside bgp to provide north south so you have the t0 connected you have the t1 connected now you can use bgp and you can redistribute these routes to the external world okay that's the complete mechanism we have now quickly go and check the tier 1 uh, features the tier 1 supported things we have so they have the connected routes we have discussed about this static route they can configure the nat ip is there the load balance whip feature the load balance is nat ipsec local ip and dns forwarding ip so these are the supported routing and the service features in tier 2 architecture it's not mandatory but uh, vmware is recommending that you use this type of model and this is very much scalable and supporting most of the feature that we have all right so let's stop here all right so now we are ready to perform the lab task now in this lab task we want to go and enable certain services over t0 router and with those services you'll find that from outside so from this pc i will be able to access to any of the resources hosted behind the t1 t1 router and vice versa and next thing is that I will be uh, able to send the traffic from outside to inside and able to access the web VM. And over the web VM, we have certain website hosted so we can go and access the website. All right. And obviously the traffic will be vice versa. So from out to in, in to out, we can do the communication the theoretical portion or theory related to how the communication happening and all those things i have already covered in the previous section so let's go to the dashboard and from the dashboard i will show you that how you can achieve this target rest of the ip addresses and schema you can see here uh, just you can make a note of that let's quickly go to the nsx manager dashboard and from there I will perform the task so here you can see that we are inside the dashboard you close if we have anything let me go and start from the beginning so I just wanted to show you the nodes and once you're inside the node you can go to the edge transport node 
and over one of the edge, edge node 0, 1a, you can see that one logical router is configured, right? That is nothing but our T0 gateway 0, 01. Now next what I can do, I can go to the networking. We can go to the TS0 gateway. Because this TS0 gateway, the router is connected. Uh, he has the connection with the external world and he has the connection with the T1 as well. So if you go to the network topology and in starting 3.0, we have this topology option that we can go and view the topology. So here you can see that we have the T0. Uh, the mode here you can see that's the active active enable. We have T1 failover non-primitive. Then we have the logical segments, right? And uh, uh, you can see the IP addresses as well. If I can just zoom out. Oops. So the IPs are going out. Anyways, you can see the IPs as well. And then uh, one service here. So in between the interfaces, you can see the IP. Right, and oops, and uh, over the top interface also you can go and see the IP, you can see all the segments as well. Great. So there is one segment called T0 uplink one. Let's go here to the T0 and check the link. So we have the router link. This is actually a link between T0 and T1 and if we go and maximize this, let's see that uh, the link, the interfaces that we have, we should have one external interface here. You can see that external service, external and service interface. It is actually connected with EN1 uplink. I can see the IP address over this interface. Uh, you can see the rest of the configuration as well over this interface, right? Great. So we have one interface that is going towards the uh, towards the uplink towards the physical router, and then we have one interface that is going towards the T1 as well. Okay. Great. So we are very much good here. Now, what we want to do, we want to create some sort of PGP relationship in between. T0 and the external world. So for that, if your BGP is not enabled, you can see you can go and turn it on. Uh, turn it on, save it, and then you can go and do any any changes. Means if you if you want to do any configuration, first turn on the BGP, give the local A's, give the basic information, and then it will be good. Now here we can see that we have the BGP enables. I can click here, I can expand this so you can also see that uh, this is the neighbor, this is the source IP and a rest of the information plus route filter. If we have any advanced configuration related to timers and password, it will show you everything. So BGP is also set up and running, okay, with the physical world or physical router. Let me go back one more time and you can see that neighbor. That's okay. Okay. All right, so BGP is also configured here. Now what we need to do that, uh, let me go to the topology back. So what you need here is this, that uh, you should advertise this interfaces that is just below T1, right? Then only the T0 will come to know that uh, in the below segment, we have some network that need to be reached to the outside world, right? So that's the reason what we need to do next that uh, we have to go to the T0. Let me clean all this drawing. Clear all the drawing. Let me go to the T0. 
once you are inside that T0, let's click this start, go to edit. Once you are in the edit, you have to go and do some changes related to route redistribution. Let me scroll a little bit down. Here you can see that we have route redistribution. And here in the route redistribution, you can click route redistribution. And uh, you can see that route redistribution, redistribution we have two. So let's see that from T0, we are advertising the routes. Let me go and click edit here. And then you'll find that uh, I can go and click this number, connected and static. So you can see that uh, from T0, we are advertising the static, we are advertising the connected interface. But what about T1? That's a T1 subnet should be reached to the outside, right? So for that, you should go and enable connected interfaces and segment, connected segment, service, interface subnet right by default it is checked so these routes we need to check mark and now you can see that this is three click add click apply save right so we have done this save and then close the editing now we have our uh, routing redistribution configured. We have done all those steps required for this particular lab. We can go to the CLI and let's try to ping 10.11. We know that the VM IPs that we have, desert 72.16.10.11. Let's see that if we can do desert. Now you can see that trace route is going towards 192.168.110.1. Then it is going towards the T0 gateway router and then it is going towards the logical segment. So you can see that after this configuration, we are able to reach. So from outside, we are able to reach to the internal network. Likewise, let's see if we can reach to 30.11. Meanwhile, this trace is going on. I just wanted to open the web browser. This is web01 corp local. And this is something, some script. Do we have any other? This is for app. This is for Web01B app. I can see that for Web01B, the uh, we have access to the customer database. This is just for demo purpose, right? All right, so we are very much done with this particular lab. Let's stop here. This section will study that how with tier zero and tier one architecture, NSX providing us fully distributed two tier routing architecture. And one thing it's very important to note here and let me highlight that, that uh, the NSX, the idea behind the routing is that it is motivated to do all the routing facilities closest to the source. So whenever uh, the routing lookup happens, it happens closest to the source. That's the one of the key we have. Apart from that, when we have the tiered architecture, we'll see that how the routing uh, would be simplified. So let me show you in the next diagram. Here in this diagram, you can clearly see that uh, you have tiered architect architecture. You have tenant one, you have tenant two, and this is something uh, say for example logical view but if you see the copy of this particular logical view in uh, transport node view you will find that one copy is showing with hypervisor one so inside hypervisor one you have tenant one tenant two other copy or other instance for hypervisor two you can see here that you have vm2 
hosted on hypervisor 2 there also you have tenant 1 tenant 2 and both the places you have the tiered architecture so here you can see that you have tier 1 and here you have tier 0 and these copies are there for all the hypervisors so hypervisors they can think their own routing and that routing is in two tiered architecture now suppose for example uh, vm1 wants to communicate with vm3 then how the routing lookup will happen so obviously what will happen because this all the drs that you are seeing here either tier 1 and tier 2 or uh, tier 0 and tier 1 they are local to the hypervisor correct means they have the kernel module installed inside the hypervisor now what is happening that suppose he wants to communicate to this particular IP first of all he will contact to his own gateway now the gateway what he will do he will contact and check oh do I have routing uh, hey uh, tier 0 I have advertised you my connected routes and other service routes so do you have do you know that how to reach to VM3 this IP and then he will forward that request to uh, other side that is the uh, tnn 2 dr and then it will reach to the destination correct so in this way you can see that even your packet is not leaving hypervisor one because all the routing is happening local to hypervisor number one same thing uh, same explanation here you can see so vm1 wants to send a uh, vm1 is in uh, tnn 1 sends packet to vm3 this is the destination in tnn2 the package is sent to its gateway that is your uh, tnn1 that's nothing but your local tier 1 dr so let me show you again here in this diagram you can see that you are sending the two different tenants this is something like inter tenant communication happening over hypervisor one now what is happening that that tier 1 dr they are sending that packet to tier 0 DR uh, following the default route and we know that we have internal connectivity between T1 and T0 we have seen this earlier and in upcoming sections also I'll show you that how tier 0 and tier 1 they are connected now once the packet is reaching to tier 0 what tier 0 is doing that routing loop lookup happens at tier 0 DR it determines that this IP subnet is learned uh, from TNN2 tier uh, 1 DR and the packet is routed there so he knows that whatever request I got from say for example tier 1 this is nothing but say TNN1 and then he, here again you have tier 1 and this is nothing but TNN2 this is my tier 0 router so once you know that okay this is learned from TNN number 2 and tr1 router then it forward that packet towards the destination so routing looker happen at tnn2 uh, uh, dr this determines that this subnet is directly connected l2 lookup is performed and then whatever uh, logical uh, subnet it has or the subnet connected with the logical switch it will forward that packet to that particular subnet to that particular uh, vm to be more precise and in the reverse way also the same thing will happen so return traffic again will come here go to tier, uh, tier 0 and then again it will go to uh, dr1 tnn1 and destination it will reach to the destination so one thing you can see irrespective of different tenants your packet never leaves your hypervisor kernel module correct now what will be the case that uh, your destination will be in different hypervisor so how the packet flow will happen so let's see this now here you can see that diagram is like uh, very busy but what is happening suppose uh, vm1 wants to communicate with vm2 that is over other hypervisor correct so in that case what will happen this is quite interesting use case so what will happen here you can see that you have different tenants and you have different hypervisor as well so let's see that uh, how the packet will flow so first of all he wants to communicate with this particular destination he will send his query to the gateway gateway will send his query uh, to the tier 0 tier 0 dr 
Now TR0 uh, DR, he has to figure out uh, that, oh, this particular destination belongs to TNN2. So he will go and consult hypervisor 1, TNN2, TR1 DR. That means this guy. Now once uh, the packet will reach to TNN2, TR1 DR, then he will see, he will do the lookup and he will calculate, oh, this particular destination is on other hypervisor here it should be hypervisor 2 so this is on other hypervisor and the other hypervisor with tier 2 uh, with tnn2 tier 1 dr correct so now what will happen exactly here that at this point of time this particular dr because this is hosted over hypervisor 1 and this particular DR that is hosted on hypervisor 2. This is 2. So they what they will do that they will form tunnel in between them. So forming tunnel means what what will happen that whatever source and destination. So you have your source IP. You have your destination. So actual source and actual destination IP. They will be encapsulated inside the tip address. So whatever source step and destination step is there, so step one and step two, and then packet will get encapsulated and it will be forwarded to this particular DR. Now what this DR will do? This DR will decapsulate this packet and then he will do L2 lookup bottom and he will identify in which particular subnet that I have uh, this particular source belongs to. So he will forward that frame or he will forward that packet to that VM2. Okay. And in the reverse also, the same thing will happen. So in the reverse direction, what will happen? In the reverse direction also, when the packet will come, it will go and query to, to, uh, to the TR0. Then it will go and the TR0 will query to this particular uh, this particular say TNN1 tier 1 DR and now this TNN1 DR he will form the tunnel in between these two devices so you have tunnel let me try to draw in like this so they will form actually tunnel and then they will do the encapsulation in the reverse order so this time the source will be this IP the destination will be 10.11 this IP and then they they will put the source step and so for example tip 1 and tip 2 and then packet will go at this point he will decapsulate the packet so encapsulation and decapsulation will happen across different different uh, tier 1 dr let me quickly show you all these mechanism that we have uh, discussed from vm1 to vm2 so here you can see that it will send the packet to the gateway now gateway he has the default route towards the tier 0 so he will forward that packet there now tier uh, 0 dr he will determine that this belongs to tnn2 tier 1 then he will go and do the query to the tnn2 tier 1 dr now what will happen that uh, tnn2 dr uh, will do the lookup and he will find oh this is belonging to hypervisor 2 i am hypervisor 1 but we are in the same tnn so what will happen that the tip encapsulation so hypervisor one will encapsulate and it will send that to the hypervisor two tep because they will form the tunnel in between them then hypervisor two they will decapsulate the packet and then the packet will deliver to the vm2 so this is you can see the power and the logic behind this uh, multi-tier architecture uh, with tier 0 and tier 1 with multiple tenants so this will be the flow of packets so i hope you understand and it is actually a very important section that we have completed here so let's uh, stop here now we reach to high availability section and in this section we will see with the services what modes we have available with respect to high availability Actually, with T0 and T1 routers, or you can see that uh, uh, SRs, so T0, we have two modes available, active-active, 
an active standby while with tier 1 routers we have only active standby mode available in case of high availability now why we have these modes available why with t0 we have active active uh, active standby when t1 active standby we'll understand in this section so service high availability we know that over the edge nodes we have the srs whenever you go and enable the services such as NAT, firewall, BGP, et cetera, then the SR will come into the picture, right? So one router having two phase, they are working as a distributed routing because they are distributed across the, across the hypervisor. And then we have something called SR routers. They can't be distributed. They are something like they are doing local routing within that particular node. So that's the difference actually we have with the DR and SR. And in case of SR high availability, let's try to understand the active active case. So active active case means that whenever you have connection to the outbound or the physical network, in that case, both the SRs, they can work as an active forwarder. Now, the only drawback we have here in this mode is this, that they are working as a stateless. Right, they are working as a stateless means they will not go and maintain the sequence number, connection table, state table, etc. So if you have to run such some sort of uh, stateful services like a stateful firewall, a stateful NAT, then this is not the mode for us. Then we should go and check active standby. There is one other very important thing inside active active that what will happen in case of asymmetric routing. So for example, if we, if your physical interfaces, they are receiving different type of prefixes coming from northbound to the SR routers. What we can do in that case, that not only in this link, we can go and enable eBGP, but here where we have SR to SR interconnectivity, there we can go and enable iBGP. So iBGP will go and sync the databases. So uh, in case of asymmetric routing, there, there will no case of asymmetric routing because all those SR routers, they have common database, common routing topology. Now this SR link by default, they will go and use 169.254.0.128 segment, right? And uh, then you have this IBGP running in between them. So here you can see that the reference topology, uh, which is providing you the high availability, both the SRs are active, active. Now there are use cases that suppose if one of the, one of the SR will go down. So obviously because since this is also active, this is also active. If this will go down, still you can send traffic in this direction, uh, vice versa. Okay, so this is the complete picture of active active that is only available with tier zero gateways or tier zero routers. Now active standby, it is present for both the T0 and T1 and we'll see that how it is usable with T0 and T1 and what's the differences as well. Now in that case, what will happen when you are using active standby? So obviously one will work as an active, other one, other one will work as a standby, means one is actively forwarding the traffic. And if active will go down, the standby will become active. Now suppose if you go and in enable the primitive mode. So suppose if I have enabled the primitive mode, if active will go down and if it will come back, means if it will go and recover itself, then again, this active will become or treat as an active. Otherwise, in non-primitive mode, the stand will, standby will become active and then he will still forwarding the traffic via this direction. Okay, so as we know that uh, T0 and T1, both are supporting this active standby. What's the difference? So let me tell you the difference. Now the tier one gateway, active standby SR have the same IP address. So both the T1, T1 having SRs, the two SRs working as active standby, they have the same IP address over the devices, but since one device is working as a standby, so that will be operational only 
suppose this is active, this is a standby, and uh, this is working as a operational down. So this will come into the picture only when this will go down, right? So meanwhile, whenever the standby device, they are getting any type of uh, uh, request, any type of uh, transaction, any type of communication, they will go and automatically drop the packet. So we can go and have same IP address. There's no problem, right? Because both are not working as an active active or both are not uh, peering with the outbound interfaces, etc. So it's perfectly fine if they have the same IP address. But the tier zero gateway in their active standby, they have different IP addresses and their standby routers, they are working as a backup. Why they are working as a backup? Because uh, we are going to use, so system will go and use AS prepend three times worse. We know that whenever BGP route selection criteria is happening, they will go and prefer the shortest A's. If you go and add more number of A's, so any prefix is coming from this direction, it will go and prefer the shortest A's. Suppose this is only one hop. Now, the same route can come in this direction as well because this is your standby or this is your backup route. But if you go and make the A's prepend, as three, that means it will come into the picture only if this particular link is down. So here you can see that by the route optimization or by the BGP modification, we are making this particular link as a backup. But in case of tier one, you know that tier one, this is completely down. This is completely operational down. But in case of T0, Still, your standby can go and peer with the BGP routes, with the eBGP routes. They can learn, they can do, uh, they can do all the learning, but they will not forward the active traffic. But still, they know that how to reach to their destination and all. Okay, so that's the key difference we have in case of uh, active standby. In case of tier one, both having same IP in. Uh, in tier zero, both the interfaces having different IP addresses over the interfaces. And that's written here that in case of uh, tier zero, we'll find that uh, they have different IP addresses because they have to form the eBGP relationship with the uh, northbound traffic or with the physical infrastructure that is sitting uh, behind that T uh, zero gateways. Right, so this is the concept related to T0, T1, related to high ability. Uh, now we can go and stop here, and next section we can go and perform the lab task. Now we know the theory, let's do the lab task. So what I'm going to do here is this, that uh, over the T0 interface, I will find that we have only one router that is connected for T0. And uh, that particular router you will find that is peering, means it has BGP peering. So this T0, so let me go to the networking. And inside networking, we'll find that T0 gateway in our lab having BGP peering with the north pond router. That's the V pod router we have here. You can see that we have the BGP peering and um, the SR. So services are running here. And you can see that, uh, yes, we have uh, one of the neighbor. Now what I will do that I will go here and uh, connect to the party. So let me go and connect with the party first. So I just wanted to have party here. And in this lab, we'll find that you have party session that you can go and open. Seems that the screen resolution is not up to mark. Let me check here. All right. So I can see that uh, I have a party session here and this edge, so where it is installed, this particular 
tier zero SR services are running over cluster. And let me show you the cluster as well. So we can go to the system. I mean, from T0 also, you can see that, but let me show you from cluster as well. You can go to the fabric nodes. And once you're here, you'll find that we have edge cluster. Inside this edge cluster, I can see that we have edge cluster uh, zero 01 inside that we have edge node zero 01, right? Now, if you come, if you come back and if you check T0, and it is linked with T1, that's okay. If you expand this, let's see, um, this edge cluster. So it is hosted over cl edge cluster zero one, right? And the interfaces, so let's check the interface. We have external service interface. And this internal service, uh, interface that we are going to add one more. It is hosted over edge node 01A. So what I want to do here, I just wanted to go to the putty and let's go to the edge node 01. Let me go and log in here. So let me give the credential. And once we are logged in inside this, what you can do, so from this particular edge, you can do get logical router. So you will get the information about all the SR and DR hosted here. So I can see that we have one SR, you can see this one, SR2 gateway 01, service router TA0. And what's the VRF? VRF is one. So now what you can do, you can do VRF worth one. And now we are inside tier zero SR. So here we can go and do the get BGP neighbor summary or uh, in Cisco we are doing show show IP BGP neighbor summary etc. show IP BGP summary. Here you can see that we have one neighbor 120.1 right. Uh, this is the neighbor IP and session is established. Even we are receiving some in prefix and out prefixes as well. Right, so you can see clearly here that one of the SR is, uh, uh, we can see that SR over this particular edge node, right? Now, what I will do that I'll go and add one more interface. So we'll go and add one more interface here. And this interface name, we can give uh, say EN2 uplink one. Type is external, that's very much okay. And what's the IP? So the IP address, I can go and give, oops. you can go and check the IP address because uh, it should be not like this. So let me close this. And let's give the IP 192.168.120.1. I think on the other interface, we have IP.120.3. So here I'll go and give 24 and connect it to segment, uh, let's see here, to uplink one, right? And rest of the thing is okay. Only thing that we need to add here is that which particular edge. So we have one edge cluster. And inside that particular edge cluster, one of the services are running over edge node 01. So I'll go and use 02. And then we have to go and save this. So now I will go here and save this configuration. We can close this. And now clearly you can see that we have two interfaces, right? So we have 120.3 and then we have 120.4. Now we have to interface. Now with help of this particular interface, I just wanted to go and do the IP, uh, do the BGP peering, right? So for that, again, what we can do that uh, we can go, you can see that we have the BGP option here. You can go click to the BGP. Once you are inside the BGP, you can see that we have BGP neighbor. 
I can go and click BGP neighbors. And we have this BGP peering that is going on. You can go click these three dots, edit this. And then we can go and give the add one more source IP. This time I'll go and add 120.4. Now, rest of the things are very much okay, but in uh, upcoming lab, we want to check the ECMP or the uh, reconvergence, fault tolerance re reconvergence. So I'll go here and reduce the timer. I'll make this uh, hold down timer 15 seconds and keep alive timer 5 seconds. So 5 into 3, we have that. Now we should save this. I will go and save this particular setting. Click close. Oops, that was in progress. We should see here that uh, the number of neighbors. So if I am here, source addresses, it should show you to, oh, yes, that's right. So now what I will do here that uh, I will go to the BGP. Um, so I will log into the SR, the new SR that we have created over other edge. That is nothing but edge node 2 and then we'll go and check it. Okay, so again, I can go to the party. Let me open new session. New session I will open and this time we'll go to edge node 0 2. Let me log in here. And let me log in here. Now, once we are logged into this particular edge node, we can use the same command, get the logical routers. So logical router, actually not routers, router. And then we see the SR VRF is two, right? So then we'll do VRF two. And now since we have created one other service interface, you can see that SR services are running. Now here we can do get the BGP neighbor and the summary. And you can see uh, just one minute, 30 seconds back, we have this session and this should be established, right? So now you can see that clearly from the interface, so uh, from the tier zero, router we have two service interfaces going outside right and uh, i will show you that at the moment we have active active scenario i haven't shown you that but uh, we have active active scenario and we have seen that the ip addresses over the interfaces are different because both the ip addresses they are forming the ebgp relationship on on the top gear or the physical device right so if I go back to the dashboard, let's go back to the dashboard. And once you are inside the dashboard, um, if I scroll up, you will see that the uh, HA mode is active, active, see? And obviously you have option that if you go click edit, you can make this as a active, active, or you can make this as a active standby. But in case of tier one, you have only one option that is active standby. Correct, so this is the lab related to that, how we can go and uh, do the uh, do the high availability configuration, uh, do the routing pair in the outbound physical network. We are very much good to stop this video here. Let's just stop. So far, we have done all those configurations related to creating new SR, pairing with BGP. Uh, we have our SRs over different edge node, right? Now, in this case, we just wanted to do the failover testing. So I will go and bring down one of the edge node where we have the SR. So that means automatically the link will go down. And then you will see that uh, the traffic will flow over other interface because we have active active scenario. We have two interfaces pairing with the outside world. Okay. So let me go quickly open the CMD command prompt. And from this command prompt, suppose if you go and do the trasert to one of the web VM. So we know that we have web VM. 
0 to a and uh, corp dot local so what we want here is this that uh, we simply see that how we are able to reach to this particular web vm is what is the gateway so now you can see that it is going via 120.3 next what i will do I will go and bring down this 120.3. This is our edge node one, right? We have seen this uh, in this in our previous section. So what we can do here, I can go here to the vSphere client. Once we are inside the vSphere client, then let me log into this. And oops, uh, okay, let me log in, okay. It's not correct credential. Okay. Let me try login one more time because I have done some mistake there. And yeah, this is the correct credentials. And once we are inside the VSL client, I will go to the edge node one. And that edge node one, I will go and bring it down. So here you can see that you have edge node 01A and we can go and do the shutdown for this particular edge node. So power off, right? Power off this, oops, I should do yes. I want to do the power off. And we are here, we want to bring this down. When this is down, then we will see that it will go down. So power is off. Now we'll go back to our testing place where we have done the trace route. Now this time you will see that it will get failed. Why? Because, oops, it's fast. Uh, since we have given the BGP hold down timer and that hold down timer was 15 seconds. So maybe first few packets will find that it is down. Once BGP will get converged, then you will find that it is going via 120.4 instead of 120.3, right? So this is the failover testing, all the configuration part we have done in our previous section. So that's why here we don't have much to verify uh, because our configuration uh, a, was in a way that it should go and work. I'll go and bring this up. It will take some time to come up back online and once it is up uh, now it's up to primitive action what we have so you will see that uh, if it is preemptible again it will start going via 120.3 otherwise it will continue forwarding by 120.4 all right we are very much done with this particular testing scenario let's uh, stop here let's uh, start with nat NAT, we know that it's an address translation. Uh, you can translate addresses from inside to outside, outside to inside, or maybe inside private address to outside public, outside public address to inside private addresses. So it's one type of uh, low level or some sort of security as well, that you are hiding some internal detail uh, when you are going outside. We have three different type of NAT supported, source NAT, destination NAT, and a reflexive NAT. Now the source and destination NAT, they are actually a stateful. So they are maintaining the state, and uh, whenever we are applying the source and destination NAT, you can see that uh, users can apply NAT rule based on five tuple match criteria. So we have five tuple match criteria when we can apply the source and destination NAT. Now source NAT simply that your source IP, you want to translate to the public IP, so you can save or you can protect your private IP address space uh, while uh, translating to the public IP. So outside world will think, oh, this is something that is public only. So they will not think that this is private address. So you're hiding the identity plus you are um, storing some sort of uh, IP as well, or you uh, you are preserving some sort of IP addresses as well. So both both the things are there, but basically we are using NAT for some sort of security reason. So now this is a de facto 
everywhere whenever the internal IP wants to go outside it should be NATed translated and then it is going outside then we have the destination NAT that is again uh, that means that something is coming from outside want to access inside private addresses so at that time destination NAT will happen uh, both these source and destination NAT they are keeping track of the sessions that's why they are actually the stateful now we have the state list NAT as well that is a reflexive NAT used for a state less connection or where you are not tracking the state of the connection the use case for this is the asymmetric path because one path you have uh, some information other path you have some information both the paths are not uh, syncing their state information so that's uh, they can't do the uh, they can't have track of the statefulness that's the key here so in this case it is not tracking the state because it is for asymmetric path or the use case is for active active ECMP so both the devices are active so one way I'm sending the packet other way I'm receiving the packet so it's very difficult to maintain the state so that's why uh, this is not a stateful that's why it's a stateless so here you can see the stateful source NAT destination NAT can be enabled on both tier 0 tier 1 gateway the stateless reflexive NAT can be enabled on tier 0 gateway generally used for active active or we are doing the ECMP with them okay so let's uh, stop here and in the next section we have to perform the lab task and we will do cer a certain configuration related to NAT and then we will do the verification as well all right, so we can stop here now. Let us perform the task related to NAT. So what we are going to do here is this, that we will go and create the tier one gateway for NAT. Then that we will go and connect with the web logical segment. Once we have that gateway, once it is connected with web, then we'll go and create the uh, NAT rule, both a static and a dynamic NAT. And once we have all these features configured, then we will go and verify in the next video. So in this video, I'm going to do the configuration and follow video will go and do the verification. So let's go and do the creation for this NAT, but before that we should create one tier one gateway uh, just for our verification purpose, how we will go and do the verification as well. So this is my T1 gateway and this is related to NAT, right? It should be linked with the T0 and it should run over any of the edge cluster, either 0, 1 or 0, 2. The edge pool uh, allocation size that's okay failover is non primitive the rest of the uh, you can see rest of the options that we have we will leave it but we should go inside the route advert uh, advertisements we should advertise the connected and the segment service ports and we should advertise the online IP because then only from t1 it will reach to t0 from t0 it will be redistributed inside BGP and it will reach to the outside world and vice versa. So now we have the gateway created uh, at the level of T1. We should go to the segments and inside this segment, I will go and do the edit because this time we want this segment to talk with our newly created uh, gateway. That is the NAT gateway. And here also you'll find the rest of the things are okay because the IP is okay and other informations are okay. And uh, what we can do here is this, that uh, let me scroll a little bit down. So here I can save this. Once we will save this configuration, close the editing, we can go to the topology section let's quickly verify and inside the network topology you'll find that now we should have this uh, web ls 
connected with our new gateway. And in between T1 and T0, you can see that we have some internal IPs. And those IPs also we should advertise, uh, we should uh, actually do route redistribution inside BGP, right? Then only it will uh, go to the next shop. So for that, you should go to tier one segment. You can go uh, tier one gateway, not segment. You can go click edit. And uh, you should reach out to the uh, interfaces where we have the route redistribution, where we have the route redistribution. You can see here that we have route redistribution here nearby BGP and click this route redistribution. We can see that we have total three that we can go and click. So first click edit and then go there. And once you reach here, you can see that clearly we have the NAT configuration, you see NAT IP. So you check mark this NAT IP, okay? And the rest of the things are very much okay. We can click apply. You should add this, apply this, and we can save this configuration change that we have. Once you save this, it will show you for inside the one. Close the editing. And we are very much good. Okay, so we have done all the configuration, pre-configuration uh, prior to go and do the NAT rule. So now what I will do, I will go to the NAT. Let's click to the NAT. We'll go and create the NAT rule. But the NAT rule we are creating for the T1 gateway, right? So you have to go to this drop down menu. You should go and select T1. And then we'll go and create the NAT rule. So here you can see by default action is DNAT. And let me decrease the font size so you can see everything. So the name, you should give the name. I'll give the name a web destination NAT. Let's just start with destination NAT. So what's the destination IP we have? The destination IP we have, and then we need the translated IP. So 10.10. .10. Uh, maybe 30. 200 is the destination IP, right? And then what is the translated IP? 172.16.10.11. So destination IP and translated IP, that's okay. Then firewall should use bypass here, bypassing the firewall rule and uh, click save. So we have created one rule and that is destination NAT. I will go and create one more that will be source NAT, source specific NAT, give S NAT here. Then what is the source IP? We have 172.16.10.11. And then what is the translation? So for example, 80.80.80.80. I can translate to this IP, right? Then, uh, let's use bypass here, click save. So now we have a rule created, source NAT and destination NAT. And I told you earlier that we'll go and do the verification in the next section. So we can stop here, but what was the IP 10, 10, 10, 30, 200 and some CGI bin slash uh, app dot peer. This is the URL just to verify that it is working or not. So you can go try check here and it is opening here. Uh, the rest of the verification, let's stop here. The rest of the verification will go and do in the, uh, in the follow-up video. Let's just stop here. Let us check the verification part. So now when I go and open this particular IP and this IP we have given, uh, let's go back and check the NAT rules we have. So if you go and check the NAT rule, you'll find that we have created two rules, right? Inside NAT. So we have created the source NAT and the destination NAT. 
And you can see here that for the destination NAT, if I go to the outside, means this particular PC, and if I go and give this 10, 10, 30 dot 200 IP, because it should be get translated to 10 dot 11, right? But you can see here that it is getting translated to 80, 80, 80, 80, why? Because again, we have something called the source NAT. So this IP getting translated to 80, 80, 80. So that means that our NAT rules, they are working perfectly fine. Okay. Now, can we go and check this inside the uh, firewall rule? So for that, let me quickly go and uh, do the party session here. And uh, uh, we know that where exactly we have instantiated our gateway. That is nothing but the cluster two. In cluster two, uh, we have edge node uh, three and four, right? So again, let me go and log in to the edge node three. And in the meanwhile, what I have done, I have, I am doing one continuous ping, so let me go stop this. Let's see there and then I will do the ping test as well. So first of all, try to get the access to that particular SR. So if you go and check the logical router here, you can see that we have the S1, S1 or SR actually, SRT1 gateway NAT, whose VRF is four. So we'll go to this particular SR. And here we can go and check the forwarding. So if you go and check the forwarding, you can see that the SR is forwarding and it should forward some of the IPs that we have created. So let's see, it is, at least it is forwarding 172.16.10.0. But if you go and check the other SR instance and there you will find that it should forwarding that uh, 10 network as well. So why not let's check the edge node one as well. And let's see that uh, edge node one, what he is forwarding. So let me go and create the new session. And this time I want to connect to edge node zero one. And uh, let's see. So we are inside edge node 01 and if we do the, get the logical routers, router, see the SR entry we have, that is with, uh, that is with, we can see that T0 gateway SR. Let's see that if he is getting the entry that should go to the outside world, right? So for T, zero SR entry, what are the entries that T0 is forwarding to the external world? And here you can see that 80, 80, 80. So from T1, it is getting that network that is 80, 80, 80, 80, right? And then uh, remember in the route redistribution for BGP, we are giving that, uh, we are enabling the NAT IP. So that's why inside uh, uh, T0, you are seeing that. And once you come back here, so you can go and check this T1 as well. So let me quickly go back one step. And if I go and check the VRF, that is VRF7, that is one of our DRVRF. So here you can see that uh, I can't see that uh, a network, but we have this 172.16.10.0. That is nothing but our logical segment. So we are very much okay here. And let me exit from this because what I want to show you is the firewall rule. Okay. Yeah? And that's the whole thing that I want to do here. So is it two or is it uh, which VRF is this? Let's check, get the logical routers. This is SNAT is VRF4, great. We're inside VRF4, although the font size is very small. Let me quickly go and increase the 
font size so you can see all these things in better font. Let me go and increase it. Font size get increased, great. So now what I want to do here is this, I just wanted to show you the, the firewall connection status. And uh, at the moment you can see nothing is there, but if we go and uh, we have our ping test going on, right? Okay, it's a stop. Let's do this ping test. And now you can see that uh, the IP that we are pinging is 101030.200, but it is being translated to this particular IP. What's the source and what's the destination for ping? You can see direction protocol is ICMP. Uh, you can go and you can go to the website, even you can initiate that session one more time. So that will also get captured inside firewall. So 443. So from outside, we are accessing the website with port number 443, although its certificate is not right, but you can see that TCP state is connected. So that means that our NAT is working perfectly fine. We have done the verification. Uh, let's stop here then. And we are going to perform task for DHCP. In NSXT, we can create DHCP server as well as we can create the relay as well. So we have both the features we'll see in the lab. Uh, we are going to perform the lab task with the DHCP server. Apart from that, uh, there is one requirement that when we are creating the DHCP server, this is a stateful service and must be bound to an edge cluster or a specific pair of edge node. Okay, so these are the requirements that we have in our lab. What we are going to do that will create one DHCP server that particular DHCP server will give some IP uh, and then we'll bind with cluster two. Then we'll go and create one. We'll see that how we can do all these steps. Uh, I'll show you in the lab. So you can follow all these steps. Then we'll go to uh, tier zero and then we'll add the local DHCP server. Uh, so for example, if I already have DHCP server zero one, I'll go and create DHCP server zero two. Then we need to go inside the segment. We should create one uh, segment because this segment I'm going to connect with the VM who wants the IP from DHCP. So we'll go and connect this, uh, create this. We'll go and connect with this uh, local subnet or say for example, logical uh, segment or subnet. It's actually logical segment where I will assign some subnet. We'll see that all the steps. So this logical segment will be attached with tier zero gateway zero one. All right, and uh, we'll add the subnet and the VM that we are going to attach with this particular LS uh, logical segment who will get the IP from this subnet. That's the overall goal of this particular lab. So let me go and log into the NSX manager. All right, so we are inside NSX manager here. You can see that we have IP server management. Here you have one of the DHCP server already created. And suppose if it is attached, then you can't delete this. You can see you can't delete this. So let me go and create one more. Say here you can see the server type is DHCP server. You have option for DHCP relay as well. I'll go and give the name as I say, for example, DHCP 02 and then the server IP, say 16150.1. I'm giving the same IP that we have below as well. Let's see if it will throw an error. All right, so once we have this, let's try to save this. So we are not getting any error related to duplicate object, although we have used the same IP. Now what we'll do that will go to tier 01 gateway and we'll go and edit this. So let me go and click edit. Here you can see the IP address management. I want to use DHCP local server, although you have option of relay server as well, or no dynamic IP address allocation. Here I want to add 02 
here you can see it has been changed the b is almost the same click save and now we are getting the error so what is the error once you have ha mode and edge cluster related configuration they are not changed anymore so once we have attached this local 0a dhcp 01 so it is not allowing us to do any changes but both are the same so i am going to use the dhcp 01 that we have created so far the steps are almost similar either you have server 1 or 2 but you can see the error as well once you do the configuration then you have to go and delete certain services and then only you can create and attach new services okay so let's go back to this uh, segment and I want to create a new segment. The name of this is a LS DHCP. And this is new segment. All right. Now, what's the uplink and type we have? Uh, we are going to attach with TA0 Gateway 01. And this is nothing but the overlay. Uh, set the subnet that's the very important thing we have to do so we have to go here and set the subnet say 172 let me quickly write this subnet dot uh, say 50 dot one is the gateway and then let's add the range so for example 50 dot 50 to 16.50.60 okay so from 50.50 to 60.60 and you should give the side data as well here otherwise they will throw an error add it apply it save it now what I need to do here I need to go and this particular logical uh, segment that we have created I need to go and attach with one of the VM. So at the moment it is not attached with any of the VM. So let's do that. So let me quickly log into the vSphere client and let's do the attachment. So I'm logging in to inside the vSphere client and once we logged in, then uh, I can go to this web 04a that's uh, not on at the moment but I will make this on as well so I can go to edit setting and here you can see that you have network adapter say for example network adapter 1 click browse you should see the logical segment that we have created this LSDHCP new click OK click OK and here you can see the network and I'll go here and give do the power on so power status is now on I will go and open the remote console and we'll see that while boot up it will take the IP or not if it will not take the IP then what we'll do that will go and do some manual shut or no shut of the interfaces so now you can see that it is asking us to log in so let's quickly log in here all right and if we go and check the ip address So one of the interface having IP 172.16.60.14, that's not the uh, DHCP range that we have given. So what we need to do here that we need to go and check the IP. We need to change this IP. So what I can do here, uh, what is the interface ETH0. So we can go and type, say for example, uh, I if config say for example eth0 down and then if you see IP address 
first of all make sure this interface is down so here the state is down let me stretch a little bit up so we can see now what I will do here that I will make this up so down and up means basically we are doing shut and no shut in terms of Cisco configuration still we can see that IP is this inside ETH 0 that should take IP uh, as uh, from DHCP so let's try to uh, do some changes as well here uh, let us continue and we can see here clearly that it is not taking the IP from the DHCP so let me go and change the settings so I'll go and change the edit setting we'll go here and click edit setting because I have connected the wrong interface I should not use this I should use network adapter 2 so let me go back here network adapter 2 and we'll go to the DHCP segment I want to connect this and this interface I'll roll back so we'll go here and we'll see that what was the interface there uh, here you can see that this VM reason a0 I'll use that okay so now we have the correct network interface and uh, view all the two IP addresses alright so let me go and click console let's open the console and let's verify the IP address so here you can see that it is getting the IP in the ETH1 interface and it is getting the IP from the correct uh, DHCP server because we have enabled the DHCP services all right so this way you see that we are getting the IP from the DHCP so we can go to stop here let's stop one of the reason why the corporates or company they are adopting NSXT is due to its security feature NSXT provide a tight layer of security and the security is very much uniform uh, throughout the VM containers cloud everywhere you have this uniformity first of all and we have the visibility means how we can push the policy security policy from the management plane to the controller and the data plane not only this but we have very advanced type of security as well that uh, we'll discuss in the upcoming slides so it's very granular in terms of like we can apply so for example micro segmentation we have distributed firewall we have gateway firewall we can integrate with IPS IDS so the summary of all these things is that that because we have so much control about VM workload uh, cloud integration everything is controlled and managed from one of the uh, controller or say for example from the management plane so that's the reason we have the full control visibility and then we can apply advanced layer of security and that's the key we have inside the NSXT so let us dig deeper inside what type of security features we have and one by one we'll go and study about that so first of all say for example starting with a firewall we have two different type of firewall one is here you can see the distributed firewall and other mode is say for example gateway firewall so we can integrate both the distributed firewall the distributed firewall although they are implemented at the hypervisor kernel level and that's the reason they can deliver micro segmentation at the workload level or the VNIC level so we'll see that it's very close 
to the workload and there we can create segments and then we can provide some sort of security uh, so for example my nsxt or cisco uh, aci model all these new uh, data center solution they are supporting or uh, they have a zero trust model even nsxt also they by default they are not trusting any anything so they they are they having the zero trust model if you want to trust something you have to create a rule from the management plane and you have to push to the data plane okay so we'll see that uh, they have this hypervisor kernel uh, DF, DFW built in and then uh, the micro segmentation because they have such type of a structure they are supporting very uh, tight layer of micro segmentation there are a few cases that people they have the Cisco ACI but is still for micro segmentation and other security features on top of ACI they are using other software uh, data center software or automation solution like NSXT so that's again one of the popularity we have because we can't uh, very easily in in ACI or in other data center solution provide the rules like we can do inside NSXT okay again you can see the scalability and the uh, adoption of the NSXT that they are multi hypervisor supported multi cloud supported multi container supported they can uh, support virtual and the uh, physical form factors so everything is supported nowadays they are agnostic to compute domain supporting hypervisor managed by the different compute managers means they are uh, multi uh, compute supported or multi hypervisor supported and that's the reason that uh, they can do this micro segmentation because see this is huge feature inside NSXT this micro segmentation this firewall it can sense layer 3 layer 4 layer 7 and they can put uh, metadata inside the application or they can sense the application with their metadata so they can take that metadata in the uh, say packet they can insert that metadata so firewall can identify oh this particular small bit of data belongs to HTTP or HTTPS or FTP etc and then according to that they can take uh, action as per whatever rules we have created NSXT gateway firewalls of the central light so here you can see the second flavor that's you have the firewall gateway so one is distributed firewall other one is the gateway firewall and in conjunction with say dfw and gateway firewall they can work together and they can provide tight layer of security apart from that this gateway and the distributed firewall they can integrate with ips IDS system as well so remember what's the key we have we are able to track the application id or the metadata and then we can take the action so my firewall can take action my IPS IDS can sense the application signature and take the action so here you can see now we have a more and more set of security features so we have firewall we have distributed uh, firewall so firewall in terms of gateway so two flavor of firewall we can create segmentation in the network we can integrate with IPS IDS apart from that we can uh, create dynamic grouping of objects into a logical con uh, construct like group so that is again one uh, enhanced feature we have uh, say in general when we study asa firewall at that time we can create the group of objects so for example network or maybe some sort of port number or maybe some sort of protocols subnet etc etc i mean three four groups we can create in asa firewall but in data center what's important that you can create group uh, including various tag virtual machine name virtual machine name subnets and segments so here we have much more granularity not we are only dependent upon the so for example the server or the IP or any type of application but we have range of variables that we can group together inside the grouping system so that again one advantages we have apart from that here you can see that the scope of the policy in enforcement can be selective with the application or workload level granularity 
IP discovery mechanism we have inside NSXT. We have the spoof guard so that can block the uh, IP spoofing at the virtual NIC level. We have switch security that can provide a storm control and security against unauthorized traffic. So here you can see that the portfolio is increasing starting from firewall, gateway firewall, distributed firewall, IPS IDS, micro segmentation, grouping. We can group and we can take action. We have this spoof card. We can provide switch level security, etc. So let's welcome back everyone. Uh, in this section, in this video, we are going to discuss about the distributed firewall architecture and components. As we know that whatever policies we have, we have to go and push the policy from the management plane to the control plane. So what's the hierarchy? We obviously have the management plane that is that is our NSXT manager. From there, we are pushing the policy to the control plane and the control plane will go and resolve that policy and then it will go and push to the local control plane and then it will be pushed or programmed to the data plane so that will be the complete hierarchy we are going to see we are going to check in all the different uh, planes in all the different places how it will be distributed what's the role we have uh, with all the different different uh, planes and components we have in the uh, in the architecture so in the diagram you can see that uh, we have policy so we have to go as a user we have to go log into the nsxt manager and we are writing our policy over management plane now now management plane will go and uh, do the programming or push the policy to the control plane so the control plane our centralized control plane will have this feature that they will go and convert the object to IP addresses and push it the rule to the data plane. So management to control, control to data plane, and it will be programmed to the particular VM to the particular ESXi. Right now, let's focus one by one on all these planes, how these policies look like. So let me highlight here. So we are inside the management plane. Management plane, what we'll do, management plane, we can, we'll, we can go there in the management plane. And then we have multiple options that we can go and create the groups. We can, we can go and create the segments. We can have the gateways means overall, we can go and define the firewall rule firewall policy right and not only that we are defining the policy since the management plane they have the databases as well so that means all those configuration will be locally stored a persistent copy locally stored inside the management plane right now once it is there in management plane means you can create policy right but then you have to push the policy so it will go to the control plane, okay? And then it will further go to the data plane. Now, over the management plane, you'll find that we have something called management plane agent. So inside management plane, we have the agents who will go and check the status of the flows. So obviously, you are pushing uh, the firewall rule and the rule is saying that, okay, all the, all the members inside the group they can go and access to internet or within a group if we have three tier architecture so how the web will go and use the resources of applications and applications will go and use the resources of database now who will go and monitor this flow how the traffic is flowing within the uh, within the uh, web to the database that can be tracked with help of the agent and those stats again will be updated from data plane to control plane to management plane, right? So here you'll find that uh, not only the management plane will go and have the information 
uh, of uh, means management plan will go and push to the CCP and then it will go to the LCP and it will be pushed to the line card. But here you can see that we have management plane agent as well. And actually directly management plane agent will go and have the flow record, have the stats of all the rules that we have um, from the data plane to the management plane. Okay, so NSXT manager also collect the inventory for all the host, virtualized workload on the NSXT transport node. Okay, so dynamically it is collecting all the informations as well. Great. Now next piece we have is the control plane. As I told you that management plane will go and push the copy to the control plane and it's control plane mechanism that it has to go and uh, convert that policy into IP addresses. So it will go and do some sort of object to IP mapping. So over the management plane, we are creating the object. We are creating the policies and then control plane will do the resolution it will convert those objects into a format that control plane can understand and then ccp will push the rule to lcp and we know that hierarchy right so again the centralized control plane will go and push that policy to its peer its peer is nothing but the local control plane and now we have the ccp to lcp communication all the time going on but it's uh, very important that how this load balancing will happen, correct? So when, and now you can think like this, that say, for example, we have 30 transport nodes with three segments, three managers. So each manager will be responsible for roughly 10 transport nodes. Okay, that means that we have distributed architecture in terms of management plane. And likewise, we have distributed architecture in terms of control plane as well. So if you go and check here, you'll find that uh, not only the uh, not only that we have cluster of management plane, but we have cluster of control plane as well. Now, by any chance, if you have to do load balancing, so uh, from management plane to control plane, you are pushing say for example, 10 rules, right? Now these 10 rules, if they go to 30 different uh, transport zones, means it will, it, it, it has to go and do the program for uh, maybe 100 VNIC. So it's not a responsibility of any one control plane associated with the local control plane to go and push the configuration. But from the management plane itself, it will do the load balancing for all the transport nodes and it will uh, it will distribute the load across equally across the management plane so that's a very important key we have so not only that we are pushing the uh, pushing the rules or policies but we are doing the load balancing in that as well not only we are pushing the policies but we are tracking uh, those policies as well with the uh, management plane agent. So the two uh, terms are there. So MPA is there, management plane agent is, is, there, is there, and load balancing is also there behind the scene. Okay, so that's why it's it's distributed, right? This is a distributed firewall across different nodes, and uh, you, you can see the architecture itself is telling that you have distributed uh, firewall, you have distributed local control plane, you have distributed centralized control plane. Suppose if we have fabric of three, and then if you have, uh, then you have the distributed management plane in a fabric, you have three. So everything is, is uh, load balanced and distributed across the hierarchy. Now, what is happening in the data plane? Data plane is the actual receiver and these, policies that we have, they will go and get programmed to the hypervisor kernel level. Now, once we have the policy program, suppose I am a data plane and if I have, if uh, if I am receiving the policies, I have to program it into the kernel label. The very important thing here is this, that these policies having some scope so whenever you apply these policy, this is not that it will go and program all the all the VM host, all the VNIC. 
right? Because we are defining the scope. So what does it mean? It means that since you are since you are defining the scope, right? Since you are defining the scope, that means that it will go and program this policy only on those kernels, hypervisor kernel, where it is applied to, right? It will not go and uh, do this programming all the places. Let's continue the previous section. This is actually important section where we'll learn the differences uh, in between the ESXi versus KVM a data plane deployment in terms of distributed firewall. Say for example, in terms of management plane and control plane, both are almost similar, but there are some differences while it is deployed to the data plane. So what are the differences? Let's first of all check the ESXi deployment and then we'll go and check the KVM arrangements, how it is arranged. So, so far we have a study that, all right, you have the management plane, you have the control plane, uh, you have the local control plane, you have the management uh, agent or management plane agent. So if I draw here in a small box, if I try to draw here, and here you can see that you have management plane, you have control plane. I'll make this central control plane. That's my management appliance. So these are the, these are my management appliance and it, uh, is recommended that you should have cluster of three then inside the data plane you have say for example local control plane and then you have something called MPA management plane agent as well so these are the arrangements that we are seeing here now we know that we have the transport zone and we have the NVDS so the point number third here you will see that NSXT uses NSX uh, distributed virtual switch or virtual distributed switch on ESXi host which derived from a vCenter VDS. You can see vCenter VDS along with the VMware Internetworking Service Insertion Platform. In short, this is say VMware Service Insertion Platform kernel module for firewalling. So this is the component here for firewalling. On other hand, we don't have NVDS inside KVM. Instead of that, we have the OVS, Open V Switch. All right, so let's see, first of all, the ESXi arrangement, how it is arranged here. So we have NVDS, uh, that is for virtual workload. We know about this. We have seen so many uh, slides related to this and we have performed various labs as well. So we have NVDS connected with the virtual workloads or connected with VM. Now this NV, N, NSXT distributed firewall kernel space implementation for ESXi is same, uh, same as the implementation of NSX for vSphere. Here you can see. So same like that NSXT uh, distributed firewall, same like NSX for vSphere, both are almost same. It uses VMware SIP. So for example, in short, I'll use SIP, but it's nothing but service insertion platform kernel module and the kernel IO chain filter. So we have the filter chains. NSXT does not require vCenter to be present for distributed firewall. That's the key we have inside NSXT because NSXT doesn't require vCenter. NSXT can be operated separately. Actually, it is operated separately. Uh, unlike in the NSX, say for example, 2.3 or prior version, we required the vCenter, but it is now the independent uh, software. Now, we don't need actually vCenter software to manage the NSXT. NSXT can be managed with their own dashboard. Now, let us let me show you the diagram in the next slide. So here you can see that you have your uh, NSX manager cluster where, where you have three appliances inside the cluster. You have the management plane, you have the centralized control plane you are monitoring the flow and the rules and the visibility you have for all the data path to the management plane via the MPA you have the local control plane who is managing where to put which particular rule so which particular rule will go to which particular VNIC uh, this is the user space but inside the kernel space you can see that you have the vSIP and you have the firewall kernel module 
and inside the kernel space because this is actually dfw is nothing but the hypervisor kernel module so here you can see that how the rules and the flow table is maintained uh, with help of vship the insertion service insertion platform and it is attached with the nsx vds and then you have the compute node correct so this is the arrangement this is this the way this is the architecture that distributed firewall works now let us go and check that how this is working inside the kvm inside kvm also you have everything actually you have some new things i'll show you then i will show you in the next diagram what new things you have inside the data plane we'll see that so let me quickly read this and then i'll show you the diagram nsxt uses obs and it utilizes on kvm to provide distributed firewall functionality uh, that thus the lcp agent implementation differ from esxi host uh, yes here we have obs open virtual switch there we have the nvds so that's why the implementation is different okay that's okay we can understand this thing now the kvm uh, you'll find that there is additional agent so i should highlight this in my slide but let me try to highlight here we have extra agent inside the uh, kvm why because the use of this agent is to con do some sort of conversion we'll see that what type of conversion it will do so we have nsx agent and we have lcp we have two things inside the data plane with both running at in uh, inside the user space when lcp receives firewall policy from the ccp it sent to the nsx agent so now we here you can see that uh, lcp will send uh, so the order is this here that you are receiving the rules from the management plane so you are receiving from the management plane you are creating actually in the management plane you are sending through the control plane then you are sending to the lcp and then you have something called nsx agent why because now you are going to program over obs so that's the reason so let's see here in the next uh, bullet point that the nsx agent will process and convert policy message received to a format appropriate to obs data path so from esxi you can think esxi data path how it can be converted to kvm data path that's the usability we have with the nsx agent okay and thus the nsx agent programs the policy rules onto the obs data path using open flow messages for a stateful distributed firewall rules nsxt uses the linux uh, connection track utility to keep track the state of permitted flow connection allowed by the stateful firewall rule so we have the obs firewall uh module there that is tracking the obs flow and connection table etc so now you can say that your the uh, your management plane is the same your control plane is the same but inside data plane along with lcp you have something called nsx agent now nsx agent and lcp you can see they are in the same data path this nsx uh, agent is converting whatever rules there there in the lcp it is converting so it is converting in the obs kernel module fast path module native language so that he can understand those rules and further he can program the dfw flows or rule inside the kernel okay so that's the new thing you can see that you have you don't have the service insertion platform or sip or vsip instead of vsip you have obs ko fast path module and you have one extra agent or programming or set of programs that is converting the rule into the native kvm data path uh, language or the data path in the kvm can understand that all right so i hope you understand the architecture for the distributed firewall inside the esxi and the kvm both let us discuss the distributed firewall policy lookup and packet flow and this is not different than if you know about the asa firewall or any type of a stateful firewall who is doing the filtering this is the same 
So what is happening at this point of time that management uh, plane we have created the policy control plane has done the group to IP lookup and then control plane. They have pushed that policy to the data plane. That's the local control plane and now in the hypervisor kernel module it has been installed. It has been programmed. So how the lookup will happen. What will happen when the packet will come. We'll see that I have one diagram. Let me show you that. So here you can see that you have one VM and you can see the highlight as well that you have point number one. So when the packet will come and hit the VM what will happen what the VM will do. So this particular VM here you can see let me highlight. It will check. Okay. The packet whose source is this destination is this the port or the application is this. This is for TCP sin. So for this particular packet do I have any existing flow. So first of all it will go and check the flow. Now if we go and check all the flow and he will find that oh there is no flow related to these information in a firewall in Cisco term that is nothing but the session table. So if there is no session table somewhere you'll find connection table as well. In Cisco also we are referring session table or connection table where we are referring the state full firewall inspection. So when you have a stateful firewall inspection at that time they are tracking or maintaining the session. So it will check inside the flow table. Do I have this entry existing if that entry is not there in the flow table that then it will go and check the rule table. So here you can see the rule table where I have rule one rule two rule three and rule four five etc. Now what is happening here also in NSXT also this is not different than the ACL rule pro, uh, processing or any type of rule processing in SDN. What is happening that rule will start reading the or scanning the table from top to bottom. So it will start reading from first second third fourth. Likewise they will start scanning all those things at the moment it will find the hit then it will stop the scanning. It will not go and stop anything. Uh, it will scan anything after that hit means match found stop there take the action. That's the uh, thing we have now we'll see that what's the default policy by the end of this suppose if nothing has been matched in the table then what will be the default action. But suppose in this case we can see that a rule with the five tuple entry has been matched. So web going to app with the HTTP is allowed then this action will be taken. Now once this action will be taken here you can see in the point number five that now this particular rule table will update the flow table. So what will happen next time when the packet will come it will check the flow table. It will not go and scan the rule table. This is actually the flow of packet and let's see the theory. We have some theoretical bullet points as well. So let's quickly cover it. So we have rule table and we have the connection tracker table. So we have connection table or flow table. So for example you think this is a rule table is okay and then plus you have the flow table. First of all it will check the flow table or connection connection tracker first and second it will check the rule table. Uh, if it is not found in flow table check the rule table and update the flow table. It's like that. It's algorithm or program is like that. Now the firewall can allow for policy to be a stateful or a stateless. It can check both a stateful and a stateless but remember only for a stateful entry we have the connection table or the tracker table. The connection tracker table is populated only for the stateful rules and this is true for both ESXi and, ESXi and KVM environment. Now this rule will read or process from top to bottom and once the match will happen so the uh, so for example each packet is checked against the top rule in the table before moving down. The first rule in the tab table matches the traffic parameter is enforced. The search is then terminated. So if you find the match stop the search. Because of this behavior it is always recommended that you put the most granular policy at the top. So try to uh, 
put those things that you want to match first on the top of the table so it will work properly this will ensure more specific policy and enforced first the DFD, DFW default policy rule will be located in the bottom uh, it is catch all rule packet do not matching any of the rule it will go and it will be uh, allow all now in most of the Cisco you will find a block at the bottom but here you have allow all at the bottom that's not good practice and that's why we have seen earlier that we have different methodology we have methodology say for example black list and then we have methodology say white list so once you convert into the white list that means you have to put rules so you have the rules and if the rules will not match then it, it will start dropping the packet so best practice that will go and use the white list model rather than black list model okay this ensure that vm to vm communication is not broken uh, during the staging and the migration process so the thing is that that you create first of all you do make that a firewall or distributed firewall as a whitelist and then create the rules once you have the various rules those rules will be processed first they will check the connection tracker or flow table if it is there it will take that and work otherwise if it is not match it will go and check the rule book so you have the rule book from sequence 1 2 3 4 etc and then it will go and update the flow table and the next entry is they will not go and check the rule book rule book rather than they will go and uh, follow the connection tracker or the flow table now whatever we have a study uh, you can pause the recording and the same thing point by point you can check here so all the points we have and finally what is happening that once they find the rule entry then they will go and up Update the rule table and that is for the next upcoming packets all right so let's stop here important sections we have is the grouping and micro segmentation etc now to understand micro segmentation and grouping uh, let's understand the NSX security policy how we can do the planning designing and implementation and obviously we are going to take help from grouping and we'll discuss about micro segmentation as well in the upcoming sections so we have three step process for policy design and why we have these steps and methodology why because the reason behind that we are dealing with three tier application architecture and in this application define SDN solution or application based SDN solution the security is one of the prime concern now we have 70% workload or 70% traffic that is east to west so at that time we should know how to group how to tag how to provide security in terms of micro segmentation and all that's why this design is proposed so we have policy methodology we have policy rule model so what's the model for that particular policy and finally the policy consumption how it is going to be consumed now in the policy method methodology I will see that we have various options like we have application centric infra centric network centric so when you are creating the policy uh, more precisely when you are cre creating the rule model so what type of infra or what type of a structure you have to whom you want to create the policy is it a application centric policy or it's a infra centric policy or it's a network centric policy or rule once we have a and b then obviously we should go and apply it so that's the implementation phase you have whenever you have the grouping whenever you have the segments you can go and apply those things now you here you have the broader picture you can see in the bottom you have the network layer then infrastructure layer and then application so application basically derived either from infra or network or combination of both means network uh, infra consists network and application override or abstracted from the network that's the order we have now here you can see that 
the application so when you are creating the rules related to application that means they are not tied with any so for example ip or vlan or uh, subnet application based rule means that particular application can be part of any of the subnet vlan etc etc so we are breaking the boundary of network related attributes that's why you can see here that tailored made policies specified to individual application tier functions or rules not tied to physical or logical topology able to be automated okay so here uh, actually the overall goal we have in the SVN solution is that we should create the application based rule now but uh, NSXT they are providing options to create say for example infra based rules as well so infra variables so whatever infra variables we have say for example logical and physical boundaries knowledge granularity dictated by topology all those things whenever you create the policy take these things into the consideration the network based rule or policy ip based uh, mac based static rules and it's difficult to operate and scale because uh, very much you are doing manual and here you are uh, planning for automated means here you have the full freedom here you have the constraint upon which you are creating the rule so these are the methodology one by one you can see that we have the application infra and network so whatever we have discussed uh, same things here in the slide you can go and pause the recording if you want to read out you can go through it and read it all these points these are related to application then we have few points related to infra where you the physical logical boundaries you need to know that what's the segment port vm etc etc then you have the network layer policy model where which is using the traditional approach to group the l2 l3 elements now whatever model we have either it's a infra or application or uh, application or infra or network in all three models we have option to group the objects group the same type of attributes not only we have option to group the objects but you can see in the consumption model that you can define or you can put some sort of tag you can define the scope so define the scope put the tag so suppose if we ha if i have 1000 vm 300 vm related to what a scope related to which particular business unit so for example prod production and then for example hr uh, prod for example sales prod for example uh, anything uh, say for example finance like that you can uh, scope define the scope and put the tag likewise you can have non prod and then you may have sales hr and whatever different different groups so it's easy that you can define the scope and you can put the tag on that apart from that we can uh, group the workload the so workload we can group in terms of dynamic dynamic static membership criteria based on vm name tag segment ip ports etc and we are going to create the rule in the upcoming sections we are going to create the group and then we are going to uh, create the uh, rule and then we are going to implement the rule as well in the upcoming section so it will be much more clear in the upcoming section then define security policy using the firewall uh, rule table define the security policy have categorized the policy uh, obviously i uh, will see that security policy and how this rule table look like what you need to do that you need to define what's the source what's the destination what's the service what's the application what what is the action you want to take so all these things will be defined inside the rule model so this is the overall three tier policy architecture we have where we should do the planning designing and finally uh, we can go and implement let us discuss about nsxt groups and the firewall rule methodology uh, means when we are creating the rule what are the various components we have inside the firewall rule starting with groups you can see the group is nothing but when you collect common type of things 
so you can collect various object inside a container and that can form a group now here you can see that group may refer other group so that that will become a reference object in the first definition of group provides collection of reference object representing represented in a construct called group means you have one uh, group so for example uh, one container where you have a small a small objects or a, uh, object collected inside one container and if you reference this inside some other so suppose this is a and then you are referring this inside some b so b is the referring a that is again one type of group correct and we have different type of methodology we have uh, discussed this earlier that we have application infra and networking uh, methodology where uh, we want to group the elements group the objects correct now groups allow abstraction of workload grouping from underlying infrastructure topology so we know that we have seen that we have three different type of methodology we have network we have infra and we have application so obviously you have to take abstraction of the underlay topology that you can refer at the level of application level and uh, we'll see that we have a different type of a ruling methodology so when i log into the nsx manager i'll show you that you, you have various options uh, so for example you have options related to ethernet emergency infra uh, environment application etc to whom you want to group the elements and then you can apply in, inside certain rule book again a group is a logical construct that allow grouping into common container so you may have a static like ip addresses and nsx object or you may have dynamic like vm name tag scope etc this is a generic construct uh, which can be leveraged across a variety of nsx rt features that's okay uh, you may have a static you may have dynamic when you are grouping the dynamic may, uh, means when you are creating the dynamic group at that time you can use the boolean logic boolean logic we know that and and or operation etc to group the elements a group uh, construct a logical grouping of vm based on a static and dynamic criteria let me show you here in this particular diagram so you have object inside a group you can group in terms of ip addresses ip set you can group in terms of segment so all vm vnic connected to this segment or logical switch uh, you can group like that you can group inside group so where you can refer one group to other groups so this, here you have the groups so grouping based on active directory for identify firewall vri rdsh etc so here you can see this is the group and here you have the groups this group is referring actually the ead active directory and this group is nothing but it is referencing some other group so here you can see nested group so group within a group we'll see in the upcoming slides that how it look like and what's the definition of group within group but you have groups for ad as well and then you have group for mac at this ad so mac set container uh, will be used mac set contains list of individual mac addresses so these are just the name that we can group as per these names and as per these attributes now we can group uh, a, uh, according to vm property as well so what's the name of vm what's the tag what's the operating system what's the computer name now here you can see the granularity that nsxt is providing us to create the group and this type of granularity we do not have in any other STN solution. Now they are giving us the flexibility to choose what type of attributes we have and according to that we can group the elements or the objects. We have these three major advantages. So what are the advantages we have? A rule is stay more consistent for a given policy model even as the data center environment change the addition or deletion of workload will affect group members. So say once you have the rule, you can simply add the VM put inside that rule, that's it. So you don't need to do any change in the rule. You change the membership of the workload and that rule will be applicable. So there is no CPU, memory and other uh, effect inside the infrastructure because you're not doing any major change.
then publishing a change of group membership to an underlying host is more efficient than publishing the rule change it's a faster to send down to all the affected host and in cheaper in terms of cpu and memory the nsxt adds more grouping object criteria uh, so if i uh, summarize these points what they are telling that you have much more option it's easy to add remove the group members and it's easy to edit the rule as well or members inside the rule so these are the things that we have means we have overall full flexibility and we are not uh, it is not causing much cpu and memory and it's very easy to write that those rules inside that uh, certain vm or inside the data plane nesting of the groups we have yes you can uh, have different type of attributes and you can group inside the uh, common name so for example while dynamic inclusion criteria all vm with name web are uh, included in the group so i have one sg web security group web where i have added all the vms whose name is starting with web uh, one type of group other type of group you can see that vm contains the name app and the scope so here you have the name and the scope and you are putting inside say security group pci app so you have two example of grouping here where you are collecting the name where you are collecting the name plus group then uh, all vm that connected to a segment sgdb so here you can see the collection with respect to segment that will be included in the name called uh, security group sg so for example sgdb so we can collect with the uh, with respect to name means we can group with respect to name we can group with respect to a scope and name we can group with respect to segment as well and the nice thing is this that we can group all these things inside a common group so now you have a nested group called security group app one all tier uh, whose members are web pci app and db and that's the power that we are getting in the grouping now continuing this fact we have the firewall rule policy as well so let's quickly see that how the firewall rule we are creating and obviously in the upcoming section we are going to create the rules as well with the nsx manager by default it will be in the allow mode once you convert this to the whitelist then you have to go and write the rule on top of this block all by default it will be allow you have to convert it then the firewall rule and that's the important thing we have so when you are writing the rule you have the category like ethernet emergency infrastructure environment and application i'll show you in the upcoming section that where you will see all these things so you can write the rule with respect to ethernet emergency infra uh, environment and application and once you deploy the rule once you publish the rule what will happen that in the data path they will follow this order so first of all it will check the ethernet rules means rule defined inside ethernet then emergency infra environment application etc uh, let me quickly log in to the nsx manager and let me show you this thing otherwise maybe we'll miss later on uh, let me quickly log into the nsx manager I logged in inside the NSX manager and here you can see that uh, you have the distributed firewall means I can go to the security and distributed firewall and category you can see at the moment by default this is blacklist it's okay it's allow all I can make is as whitelist and I can add the rule but we have some inbuilt rule means uh, the old rules are there here you can see and when you are seeing this rule you can see the columns the name of the rule what's the source what's the destination what is the service what's the profile applied to what's the action at the moment everything is disabled you can see anyways it's blacklisted so why i came and log into this particular uh, nsx manager at this point of time because i want to show you the ethernet emergency infrastructure environment and application 
So in the data path, you can see that this will check the policy related to these options that we have in the top and then it will be applicable. Later on, we'll log into the application and we'll see all these rules. So for example, if I want to add one new rule, uh, so we are already inside the name. What's the name of this rule is the three tier, for example, app. And I want to add one more rule in the same list. So I have this option add rule. Now it is asking that what's the rule name. So for example, I'll give the name as a testing. What's the source? If you go and click to the source, you will get the source and here you can see the add group. So I can create a group for the source. If I click add group, say test source. Uh, inside that what is the member so here you can see the name the compute members so I can go and click here and then uh, you can see the membership criteria at the moment no members are there add the criteria what you want to add the virtual machine logical port so here you can see virtual machine logical port logical switch IP set tag and here you can see when you are using the grouping you have the boolean option that you can go and use the equal you can put the tag you can put the scope clearly you, you can see here and that's why we have discussed the theoretical portion so i can go and put the tag i can go and put the scope inside this criteria correct so at the moment i don't want to create this rule I can cancel it, but you can see that you have the option here. Uh, there are a few rules, a few members, a group is there and you can see that I have one group called app server. And if you want to see that inside this app server, how many compute members are there, you can go and click. You have app 01. Let me close this. If I go to, so for example, DB and I want to see the members, I can see DB member, virtual machine and IP address then group definition uh, members ip all sort of option we have correct so at the moment I, what i will do that i'll go here and in the testing portion i will use any existing group say app servers now here you can see the app server got selected then we'll go and click here to the destination in destination also you have the same type of options that you can see here at the moment, I'll use, for example, uh, app to DB. So I'll choose this DB. So you can see the source, you can see the destination. Then you have the services. Now service is long and it's actually big. So you may have predefined services you want to choose or you can go and click add new services. Test service. And here you can see that in the new service, uh, set service entry what you want to set add a new service entry say test service now what service type is it a IP based service IGMP ICMP4 ALG TCP UDP Ether ICMP4 I will go and check this application label gateways and all but you have this option that you can go and select so for example I'll go use TCP then it is asking the source port and the destination port. So I can go and give the source and destination port, save it. So I have one service called test service. I have given the range there on the top. If you want, you can go and search. So I have this test, test service. I have search, I'll apply here. So now you can see that you have the source, you have the destination, you have test service, then you have the profile. Now this profile is basically for L7 type of application. This is for application. Uh, it's something you can see here, it's related to add new context profile. So we can leave it. We'll see this in the theoretical section, means in the slides, I'll cover it. Then you have this applied to, you can apply to the firewall, you can apply to the group. Again, you can see the groups are there. So groups are always there. Groups are there for source, the destination, even services, different type of service application also you can group. Then your profile then apply to a finally you have action. 
what action you want to take allow drop or reject once you create your rule then you have option to click on the top to publish it and then this rule one of the rule will be published inside this rule book correct so let me quickly come back to the uh, slides and let's continue all the slides I'm back to the slides and uh, we have discussed this particular slide let me go to the next and now it will become very easy to understand all these points here by default it will be in the blacklist so if you go and you use the whitelist means uh, by default you're blocking everything but you have to create a rule for that so suppose I convert it to whitelist and then I have to create the rule how we are going to create the rule we'll see that the DFW enables policy to be a stateful or a stateless uh, with policy level granularity. By default, this is a stateful and that's the requirement. We want a stateful inspection, but it can work as both. In some of the scenarios where application has less network activity, the stateless sections may be appropriate to avoid connection reset due to inactive timeout of the DFW state uh, full connection table how this rule look like you can see name source destination service profile apply to action some advanced setting and the status as well so the rule book or the rule will look like this you have to give the name of the rule what's the source and destination you can go and define the group here you can go and create the services now services are big here because you'll find that you have four different type of services so we have four options actually in the service field uh, we have predefined objects and services that we can use we can go and create uh, our own custom made service so you have seen that we have option related to uh, l4 port application level gateway ip protocol and few other criteria we have seen that list so we can go and create services like this also so for example we have created test service and we have chosen tcp port 22 till 88 correct so we can do like this uh, then you can see that you have other option like when selecting the ALG select supportive protocols for ALG and from the list ALG are only supported in the state full mode because this is related to application if the section is uh, marked as a stateless, the ALG will not implement. Additionally, some ALG may be supported only on ESXi, not KVM. So be careful. Uh, check the tech note related to ALG rules. Check the VMware support site, what type of ALG are supported in ESXi and KVM. Then we have the custom service group. Define a custom service grouping, selecting from a single or multiple services. Workflow is similar to adding the custom services except you will be adding multiple service entries and the, these four options we have in the service field then profile uh, as we discussed this thing that profile is uh, related to layer 7 application ID and FQDN uh, whitelist profile this will be used for L7 base security rules then finally we can go and apply to DFW we can apply to group so when group is used in apply to it need to be based on the non IP members like VM and objects finally you have to take the action so we have action like uh, you want to accept you want to reject so you want to allow you want to reject you want to drop so if we are dropping then uh, block the traffic silently if you are allowing you allow the traffic or ac accepting the traffic and finally reject in reject you have option that reject action will send back to initiator reset the tcp session or icmp unreachable uh, with network administrator prohibited code for udp icmp and other ip connection so you have these many options inside the firewall rule book so we are good to stop here let's now we reach to lab section and in this lab we are going to perform the lab task related to distributed firewall let me quickly show you that what exactly we want to perform here you can see that we are dealing with three tier architecture so web when they have to go and access the app they are going to use port number 8443 
app when they will go and access the db they have to go and use the port number 3306 whenever a client or any client they will go and access the website then we should give the permission uh, allow the port number uh, 443 so like that we'll go and create the firewall rule but before creating the firewall rule uh, i want to show you that by default the nsx they will go and allow all the traffic allow any so that i will go and change to the deny all and i will show you the result for that obviously once you deny then you are not able to access any of the website local website hosted in this particular lab so that the first task i will show you now the next task i want to show you in this three tier application architecture is this that how we can go use the group how we can go and use the services so i will go to the group section i will create the group of uh, website or group of uh, vms uh, for example we have uh, vm uh, host one uh, vm actually we have vm related to web and we have 0102 like that. Then we have VM related to app. We have VM related to DB. I'll go and I will group all those VM uh, inside the groups. We'll go and create the groups. And even we can go and create uh, services as well. Okay, so let me quickly go to the dashboard, NSXT dashboard, here we are. And uh, you can see that once you go to the security section, you will find that you have option related to distributed firewall. Even you can see that we have option distributed IPS IDS, network introspection, east to west traffic, and then we have um, firewall related to north to south traffic, that is gateway firewall, a URL analysis, and other security features, right? Now, here you can see that once we are inside the security and distributed firewall, and once we are inside the category of specific rules, once we are inside the applications, you can go and expand this default policy that we have at the moment. In this default policy, you can see that we are allowing NDP, DHCP, and then in the bottom, you can see allow everything. So that uh, I want to change, and I can go and click to this allow, I'll make this drop and then we need to publish it, right? So before publishing this rule, uh, let me quickly show you that if you go and access few of the sites, so you can see that uh, web trying to access app, so access via web01 to this particular app, you can see it is opening here. Likewise, if I go and check the web again hosting app.py, so you can see these sites are opening, right? Now if you go and publish this particular rule, let's publish, that means we are dropping everything by default. Now this is blacklist, right? And we know that we should have a whitelist model means we can go and create the filters. Okay, let's see if we can still access these websites here. So I just refresh the page. And you'll find that it will not open. If I go and open new session, let's see. So I'm trying to open the new session, but you can see that now it is unreachable because of that rule in the bottom, deny everything. So firewall is blocking everything now. Okay. And to allow these, obviously we have to go and create the firewall rules. But before uh, creating that, what I told you that, let's go to the inventory here. And maybe the font size is pretty small. Let me increase the font size. So once you are inside the inventory, you can see that inside inventory, we have services, groups, contact, context profile. That is for recognizing the application. Here you have some app ID, virtual machines, containers, physical servers, and tag as well. All these things we have discussed earlier on in our previous theoretical videos. I can go to the groups. Let's go to the groups first and then I'll go to services. So I can go to the groups and we can go and add groups here. First of all, I will go and add group for web servers. And then you can see here we have the option to select the members, set the members. Now members also you can go and 
check the member criteria you can check the member you can go and check the ip addresses mac address ad group see how much options we have we have good, good amount of options here right so here you can see that inside the category you can go and if you go and choose the category as virtual machines then you can see that we will get the list of virtual machine i need to scroll from here and if I decrease the font size a little bit so you can see. So here you can see that we have all those uh, VMs. I just wanted to select uh, web and web one and web two. So let's go and select web one and web two. Let me scroll a little bit down. So web one and web two I am selecting here. And once it is selected, let me click select. Click apply and uh, we can save it. So now you can see that inside a web server, we have two members. Here you can go and click view members. You can see that members. And likewise, I will go and add two more group. So one group I will go and create for app. Okay, so let's go and create uh, app servers and We'll go and add the app VM machines here. So I can go to members. And same way you can go select the category. Inside category, you will find virtual machines. You can go and check the app one. Actually, we have only one app here uh, as a VM. So I will go and add app. We can go and give the description. We can go and give the tag as well. Now these tags are very important uh, in future if you have big environment. So with help of this tag, you can filter. Okay, then you have DB servers. So let me go and create uh, one profile with DB servers. Let's click uh, set the members. I want to set the members here. So we can go to the members and then again, we can go here to the virtual machine selected. Let's go and select for DB. I can go and select DB, click apply. And now you can see that we have three different groups. So we have group of web, we have group of servers, we have app servers, we have group of TVs. Although in few of the groups, we have only one member, but like that we can go and create. Now, next thing I want to show you that you can go and create the services as well. Let us continue where we left off in the previous section. So now what we want, we want to create or add services, right? We have few of the services which are custom made and I can go and give the name of service. So we know that uh, client can go and access web web can go access app, app can go access DB. Like that, we have to create the service. So client and web, let me quickly draw here. So this thing I just wanted to highlight is this that we have client, we have web, we have app and DB. Client, web, app and DB, right? So here the service is 443, we know that this will be there by default, HTTPS. So we can use inbuilt service, but suppose if we have any custom made port, uh, say for example, 8443, that may be not there or 3306, that's for MySQL, that may be not there. So we have to go and create uh, these services which are not present. Whatever services are present, we will utilize it. All right. So I can go ahead and give the name. This may be a web. Let me give the name, logical name as well. So web access to app. And then let's go and give the service. I want to add the service entry. This will be name will be TCP. 8443 is the name. Then this service is TCP related. You can see we have options IP, IGMP, ICMP4, ALG, TCP, UDP, ICMPv6. Now source, 
what will be the source? Source may be any, right? And destination will be 8443. So like that, we can go and apply. Let's go and save this. And now you can see that uh, we have access to app, service entry TCP, source any, destination is 8443. It is in progress, I can go and refresh this. Then I will go and add one more service. This will be app, access to DB. And then likewise, you can go and add the service entry. So let's go here, let's go and add the service entry. This will be TCP port number 3306. And then this is TCP based source any and destination port 3306. So now you can see that we have created two custom made services that later will go and call inside our program. So the next step that we have is that we have to go and create the firewall rules. So for that, we'll go to the security. Once we are in the security, we can go to the distributed firewall. And here you can see that we have option to add the policy. So I can click add policy and the name, we can go and give the name for this policy is uh, something client to web to app to db. Uh, likewise, we can give uh, any any name but I have given this name. All right, so what we want here is this, that in this particular policy, we want to go and add rules, right? So you can go click these three dots, you will get this option called add rule. See, we have option add rule, add rule above, add rule below. It's up to us that where exactly we want to add. Now this rule may be, and we know that the order or the processing of the rule, it will start from top and then it will go to the bottom, right? Client to web. And maybe the font size is small. I just wanted to show all the entries that say I have made this a small. Let me increase it a bit. So, okay, you can still see, right? Now, what is the source? Source may be any, right? Any client. Then what's the destination? Destination is nothing but the web servers. And we know that inside web server cluster, we have to. So I can go and click to that pencil icon and it is redirecting us towards the web servers app and DB. Let's go and select the web servers, apply it. Click apply. And you can see that destination, it will be populated with web service. Uh, do we have services any? No, we have services HTTP and we can go and search this service HTTPS. Let's say it should come here. You can see hit number two HTTPS source any destination 443. We can go and apply it. So we are doing good. Um, and you can see in this same rule that is client to web, the context, we are not using context profile applied to distributed firewall action is allowed that we want, right? So likewise, let me give some more space here. So likewise, I can go and add a rules here. Now I can go and click this three dot add rule. And actually, I just wanted to create a rule below this. Uh, so why not go and click here? It's any place you can click and create the rule. Say so add one more rule below. I just wanted to show you that how it is happening. So now 
um we can see not i don't want to add new policy so let's uh, delete this simply go and click add 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 that's it so let me minimize the default rule and here we are in the client to web i just wanted to add one more rule here and it is coming on top but it's okay we'll see that this time the rule is a web to app what's your source obviously source will be a web web servers so let's click this pencil button and you can see that we can go and select the source as a web click apply then we should go and select the destination that will be app now you can see how easily we can go and create these rules so when you have the objects created you can simply go and you know select it and you can create firewall rules now what is the service a service we have created web to app and that will be using port number 8443 so we can go and use it action is allow applied to distributed firewall see how easily we have created then we'll go and create one more so add rule and this time we'll go and create app to db right so client to web web to app now uh, app to db so this time what is the source this time your app servers will be the source so check mark that click apply and then what will be the destination destination will be your db apply and then service uh, i should give proper name for the services it should be um, mysql as a name you should give like that here i have given uh, app access to db but we should give the name um, whatever services we are using all right so now you can see that we have three rules we have client web web to app app to db and i just wanted to move this rule so simply click here to this three dots scroll it down uh, so i want this rule in this order client to web web to app app to db now before clicking this publish button i just wanted to show you that at the moment since we have this default rule block it will not work so you can see that session is getting timed out it's not working oops i can see this database is working this is from web to app and later on we can go and check uh, this is actually this is different uh, side of esxi you can see this is web 01b and all the rules that we are applying actually all the configuration that we have is on one side that is 01a b app 1a b etc so here you can see this is timed out and later on in the upcoming section we will go and check the flow as well we'll go and see that where exactly the packets are dropping or hitting okay so now i'll go and click publish to this particular rule click publish and then you come back here we'll refresh the page you can see it is opening uh it is opening so there is no problem our creation of services in this lab successful our creation of firewall policies in this lab successful we can see that uh, it's working fine right and uh, we have completed lab so in the previous section we have created the uh, group here we have created services firewall rule it is uh, processing top to bottom and it's working perfectly fine okay so for this particular lab we can stop here and in upcoming section we will go and check the flow record as well so let's stop here